Okay, we are going. So let's bring the uh, let's bring to order the June third, twenty twenty workshop meeting of the Narberth Borough Council. Bob, I think you have to record it. I need permission from the host to. Let record. me just send this. I'm just going to send this back to you, Sean. Okay. I'm just going to record it. Okay, we're rolling. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we're bringing the, to order the June 3rd, 2020 workshop meeting of the Narberth Road Council. Uh, Mr. Metric, will you please call the roll? Sure, thank you. Uh, Ms. Rickards? Here. Ms. Pananopoulos? Here. Mr. McGreevy? Here. Ms. Elshocks? Here. Mr. Bush? Here. Vice President Weisbord? Present. President Aaron Muterich is absent tonight. Mayor Andrea Deutsch? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Metric. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Sean just mentioned, Aaron Muterich, our council president, is not here with us this evening. On Sunday, his father passed away. And he's taken some time to be with his family. And we, I know we all extend our deepest condolences and prayers to Aaron and the Mutterick family and their friends. His, his father was well loved by many in the community. I'm also aware that our hearts are very heavy for the condition of our country and that we're faced with challenges in the nation that touch us deeply here in Narberth. And we're grieving the COVID-19 pandemic and for some of us, that means the loss of people from our lives and economic instability and health security that we used to take for granted. And to add to that, this week we all witnessed the open murder by a group of law enforcement officers of a person in Minneapolis, a human being. And that surfaced some fresh awareness that we, we must do more to care for each other and prepare our world. Later during the meeting, I hope we'll hear from the Human Relations Commission there on the phone as well as members of the council here on, on these topics and um, hopefully as well from the public. It's times like this that it helps me to remember how grateful we are to have each other. For Mayor Deutsch, um, she loses a lot of sleep thinking about us and how to keep us all safe. And I'm thankful for this to serve, be serving with this current group of council members, all of you. And our skillful professional manager, Mr. Metric, his team, Mr. West, Mr. Hartman, they worked tirelessly through the pandemic, keeping us, keeping us functioning. And also grateful to our experienced police chief, John Gallagher, our police department, our volunteer fire corps. And we owe a debt of gratitude for their dedication and the discipline and commitment. They were out in this storm just a few minutes ago. They're probably out there now. And most importantly, our neighbors and business community members who are doing their best at this time for Narberth, they trust us to do our best for Narberth. And um, certainly at this moment, we miss Aaron's leadership, um, but we'll keep moving forward. And hopefully I'll remember to emulate his kindness and ability to listen to each other with respect. Mayor Deutsch, do you have any comments to make this evening? I, I do. Tonight, I actually have a pretty full report. Um, I'd like to start off again with condolences to, to President Muterich and the loss of his father um, and send the, the borough's love to his family and know that we are all holding him in our heart. Um, this week, as was mentioned, um, we, we are not only dealing with the pandemic, we're dealing with, you know, repercussions of the, the, mur uh, the murder of yet another uh, uh, African-American man uh, at the hands of police. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, at this time, I want to thank uh, our, our, our Chief Gallagher and our police uh, for working so hard and tireless on behalf of the community and, and endeavoring and continuing to endeavor to uh, work to make sure everyone is treated fairly and even handedly and with the utmost professionalism. And I, I'd like to give a thanks to our, our police force for 
for their hard efforts and um, and and we will continue to train and work to, to make sure that that continues to be the case. Um, uh, another major issue that we're going through, and I gave a full, full report in uh, the Public Safety Committee that we just had. I'll give a briefer version now. As of Friday, June 5th, the governor is going to take us from the red phase of a pandemic preparation to the yellow phase, which is a step down phase. And there's going to be some changes in the borough, although we are not, this is not the green phase. So we are not letting, you know, taking the bandaid off and everything goes back to normal. Um, I want to give people the uh, notice of some of the changes that are happening uh, as of Friday. Um, let's start with our Narbeth public spaces, our, our parks and playgrounds. As of Friday, um, the Narbeth Park fields will be open for limited use. Um, we'll be following the CDC guidelines for these parks. That means stay at home if you're feeling sick or unwell. Use social distancing when in the parks, um, at least six feet uh, between individuals at all times. And we are not going to allow organized sports or activities in the fields during this time. Um, that's not recommended by the CDC. Um, the tennis courts will be opened. We ask that people play uh, only singles and not doubles and still maintain your distancing. If you're waiting for a court, please give the, the required six feet of space. Um, our basketball courts will remain closed as basketball is a sport that require, that has uh, close contact uh, and physical close physical contact and is not conducive to six feet um, social distancing. Um, our playground, Candy Cane City, will remain closed as we currently do not have the ability to sanitize it on a regular basis and keep the surfaces, all the surfaces in there, clean, to the clean point that they need to be uh, to avoid exposure. So um, at currently the Norbeth Park restrooms will, be, will remain closed. This is just a temporary situation until we go into next week and can determine uh, how we can try to meet the CDC guidelines and, uh, and maintain safety for everyone. So the closure is just going to be over the weekend until we can figure out exactly how we can, how we can work this. Um, use of, um, it, let's uh, talking about 80 Windsor Avenue, which is the library. The library will be open with limited services. They've given a uh, description of the services they will allow. They're asking you to return your books that have been out all this time. Uh, you'll be able to take things out for uh, pickup service. Uh, refer to the website, their website, for additional information. But they will be opened on a limited uh, takeout uh, kind of situation. Um, talking about 100 Conway, the borough building. Um, borough operations will remain open. Uh, all the businesses will be continued to be handled remotely that have been permits and tax payments and service related issues. If you do require a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, make an appointment with the office and uh, follow the guidelines uh, that they have uh, installed to make sure everybody stays safe, including wearing a mask uh, and, uh, and follow whatever guidelines they have in there to, to maintain safety for everybody. Um, the big thing, um, we're, we're gonna have some openings in our downtown with the yellow phase. So, uh, so some of our um, uh, non-essential retail stores will be opening. And I went over a whole list of uh, requirements at the public safety meeting. Um, I, uh, those, those requirements are uh, also posted on Governor Wolf's website and they go into great detail. Some of the highlights, um, you're gonna have to wear a mask if you go in a business and the businesses will, the non-essential retail, we're talking stores, not restaurants. Um, uh, you, they'll be allowed to have 50% capacity in there, um, but you'll have to wear a mask unless there's there's a medical reason that uh, you cannot wear a mask. And they have the right to deny you entry if you do not have that mask. Um, and they're gonna be cleaning the, the uh, high touch areas and disinfecting uh, as per CDC guidelines. Um, if anybody has questions, they can contact me. I can give you details on uh, specific points. Uh, if for me to go over all the points now would take hours. So, uh, but if you have questions, please contact me. Um, if you can't find them on the website, contact me. I'll, I'll get you the, uh, to where the information is, is found. So lastly, um, as of Friday, you're gonna see some of our restaurants are not, uh, they're not allowed to have uh, 
dine in service. So you're not allowed to go in the restaurant to eat. Will be tables set up outside the premises uh, for uh, people to be able to enjoy their meals outside. Uh, again, there's going to be a lot of guidance from the governor's office in, in terms of how to do this. They have to maintain six feet uh, apart, um, and uh, there's going to have to be uh, social distancing and cleaning, and uh, there'll be uh, your dinners, if they're served, will be served on um, uh, the disposable dish uh, plates, um, and there are other changes the restaurants have been made aware of. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. You can also still take out from our restaurants and support them by taking out and, and ordering your favorite meals to, to eat in the privacy of your own home. Um, or, or frankly, outside at this point. You can uh, you sit on a bench and eat as long as you're maintained because we're, no we're no longer under stay-at-home order. So take out if that works for you and, and support our local businesses, and that would be terrific. Um, as far as groups go, um, there, the, we're allowed to, to meet in groups of up to 25 people, no more than 25 people, it's not allowed. And even, even if you do meet, again, you're required to do social distancing. So the virus is still out there, we're still dealing with it. And if we get real close together and start uh, uh, getting in a party-like attitude uh, atmosphere, um, we are going to wind up with a problem um, that we don't have, so don't want. So, uh, relax a little bit and stay safe, wash your hands. And if you don't feel well, stay home. And that would be it. Thank you so much, Mayor. And um, before moving on to our discussion items, um, I'd like to ask for a motion to revise the agenda of the discussion items in the following okay. way. Um, I'd like to ask that we add a short presentation from the Narbeth Human Relations Commission. And I'd also like us to add a discussion with uh, Mr. Bressy of the Narvath Planning Commission to discuss the 5A, a revised 5A amendments, zoning amendments. Bob, uh, before we make that motion, could I ask one question of Mayor Deutsch, or is this not a re correct time to do that? About the oh, about sure. the yellow face. Why don't you ask now? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I just was wondering, Mayor Deutsch, if um, say if the numbers went started to go up in Narvath during yellow, the numbers of people um, getting COVID, yet the numbers say Montgomery County wide aren't going up enough that the, the governor would move it to red. Do we, what kind of discretion do we have as a borough to limit some things in the yellow phase? Like if our, if just our- Well, if we started having a problem, uh, our health department and, uh, and if, Advise, advisories from uh, from other experts. We do have some. Uh, I have the authority to shut down places uh, if if we have to shut them down again to maintain public safety. Okay, thank but, you. But ordinarily, we'd like to follow the guidelines set for us, you know, by uh, Montgomery County and by Governor Wolf and the CDC. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, oh. sorry, Bob. The governor really has pledged to follow the science on this, and I think I don't. My sense is there, the, Montgomery County won't hesitate to close us down, you know, back to the yellow phase if it's needed. Bob, if I can ask a question too of Andrea. Um, Andrea, how are we advising citizens that see um, other neighbors breaking those rules? Whether it's people congregating at restaurants, are we advising folks to have citizen to citizen conversations? Um, are we calling the police to give gentle warnings? Um, how do we recommend we handle this? So if you see a problem, contact our police. Uh, if you, I don't want um, to, to create any confrontation between, between friends and neighbors. And, and if you think it can't be done without uh, being awkward or confrontational, please contact our police and our police will take care of it. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, any other questions for the mayor? Okay, so let's, um, can I have a motion to add the Human Relations Commission? We have Carolyn is here and, and later when it's her turn to speak, she can tell me how to say her last name. Um, I, I would move to amend the agenda to include the Human Relations is there Commission. A second. All in favor? Any opposed? 
Okay, so we will make Human Relations Commission item E on the agenda. Um, may I have a motion to add Narvith Planning Commission revised 5A zoning amendment discussion with Mr. Bressy? Hey, Bob, uh, it is on our agenda as a as 5D zoning amendment 5A district. So. Okay, I'm looking at an agenda that says council rules and procedures, which I was going to ask to remove or table this week. So you've already done that and published that agenda? Yeah, so I was following you your email yeah. from earlier. Oh, you did it from my email. Super. Um, so we will, we've already eliminated. We don't need a motion for that part. So terrific. We're ready. 5D will be Narva Planning Commission revised 5A zoning amendment. Great. Thank you. All righty. Paving uh, discussion item A, paving assessment and restoration planning. Mr. Metric. Thank you. Um, this has been a project we've been really excited about. We have found a low cost solution to uh, create an objective metric of the roadway conditions in the borough. And it's from that that we will uh, present council to make decisions about how to plan for paving both in the short term, meaning this year and the, in the short horizon over the next three years, but also plan things out and give you points of uh, contact with the plan and intersections where you can, uh, council can um, um, make decisions about where, what investments it wants to make in, in the borough streets. And this is a core municipal service. We're very excited about uh, leading this effort and it fits into our goal from a management perspective to make good um, data-driven decisions and put elected officials in the driver's seat of making good decisions. And uh, Matt West has been very integral in this process. He's worked closely with the borough engineer, Eric Johnson, and uh, Matt has compiled some of that information and would like to take a few minutes uh, tonight to present it to you all and um, sort of set the table for council. Do you need me to unmute you, Matt, or can you do that? Good, thank you. So I was uh, lamenting uh, before the meeting started that I think my computer is zoomed out and about late last week, my camera stopped working for some unknown reason, um, some mysterious reason that we'll, uh, I can't figure out quite yet. So I apologize that my ugly mug is not available to uh, everyone to stare at. Um, if I can, I'd like to share my screen here. Uh, if the host would enable that, I would be grateful. And I don't know, something about trees falling down with the uh, borough administration. It's just... Yeah, we're two for three today, right? 50% of borough administration have trees down on their property. I'm not I'm not complaining because I don't have it as bad as Sean, but uh, it's still a, a messy and bad situation here, too. I may need you just to talk me through how to give you that. Bob, Bob I think if you make Matt the host temporarily, then he can share screen. Now that is an act of trust. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so talk me through that, Rob. So if you go over to the right, you hover over Matt's name, and then there's a drop down menu under more, and it should say make host or make co-host. Terrific, there you go, Matt. All right. Thank you, Rob. Working on it. All right, everybody see that okay? Very good. Um, so I'm gonna throw a lot of data and information at you this evening. I do not expect everyone to absorb all of it 100%. I really designed this presentation as a starting point for everyone to start thinking about how Borough Council can be involved in um, taking a leadership role in, in defining a reinvestment in our critical infrastructure. And one of the first things that um, you know, borough administration believes is critical infrastructure is our roads. So roads, stormwater, and uh, sewer are the three core infrastructure things that the borough is in charge of maintaining over time. And so we've had a lot of um, uh, utility work in the borough the pa this past several years. It seems like a lifetime now. Uh, I think this is the uh, first year since my tenure in Norberth that there hasn't been some sort of disruptive utility work in the streets going on. Um, that's been a refreshing thing, but you've also seen a bunch of, uh, you know, cut up roadway. But 
what we did was that instead of you know um, using that um, the reaping money that uh, Pico or Aqua would use to dedicate to uh, repave the area that they disrupted, we chose instead to take a cash reimbursement um, from Pico and Aqua to build our capital fund. If you remember that conversation from um, several years ago with Sean leading the budget and capital plan um, discussions, uh, that was the integral role or the integral step in, um, in helping us build our capital plan or even our capital fund, which didn't exist prior to our tenure. So it's an important aspect of, uh, of the uh, money building our future that I'd really like to highlight and the, one of the key takeaways and that, you know, that council has supported uh, the borough administration's um, vision in building our capital fund so we can start reinvesting in this critical infrastructure. Uh, let's see here. What are we doing? Here we go. All right. Narberth borough study area. We all know that quite well. Here are the roads. Um, we have a total just under 14 miles of roads in the borough, and it's divided up into three types, state, local, and private. But for this project, uh, we removed the state roads since the state is in charge of paving those roads and, um, uh, and the private roads, Narbrook Park, uh, Lantwin Lane, Berry Road, Shady Lane, Brynwood Manor, municipal lot driveways, and so forth. So that brings us down to just over 11 miles, and it reduced at about 19%. So that's the universe of roads that we're looking for for this pavement scan. So if you remember, as part of the capital plan, uh, we invested in a pavement scan that was completed by the borough's engineers, Pannoni, and that was completed in uh, right around the time that uh, COVID hit, So, um, which is why we're talking about this in June instead of uh, April. It took us a while to, uh, for me to get this data to a presentation standpoint, um, but here we are. The, plan, the, uh, uh, the data that they collected resulted in over 6,000 data points. And I'm gonna show you a little bit what that looks like because at the borough level, that's what we see right now. It just looks like straight lines, but if we zoom in, there'd be a whole bunch of series of dots. And each one of those dots equals a different rating and we'll get into those ratings in a minute. And so if we zoom in to look at a couple of roads, intersection, this is looking at our road center line and where those dots, the pavement scan, intersect. So you can see that the dots don't necessarily line up with our roads, even though a dot is associated with a road. And notice the multicolored dots. Each one of those dots represents a different level. Level meaning, what is the condition of that pavement? Level one, let's call those the Cadillac roads. Those are the ones that are the most pristine uh, uh, roads in the borough. Level two, all the way up to level five, five being the worst. Good news, the borough does not have any level five roads in the borough. So something to, something to uh, cheer about, right? So if we look then, how do we make that point data more applicable to our needs? If we would then take that point data and then conflate it, which is taking that point data and assigning it then to that linear feature, that road segment, and taking the average of all of those points and assign it to that line, we then know what that intersection, that road, intersection to intersection, what that pavement rating is. If we have that pavement rating then, we can calculate road surface area and do a, multiple, a pretty simple multiplication to determine how much it would cost to repave intersection to intersection and look at then what that pavement rating is. So let's look at the meat and potatoes of this. The average rating of all roads in the borough is 2.4, which is pretty good. It's above average. So we have um, roads below average, five miles. It's almost, you know, just less than 50%. Roads that are above average, 6.25 miles. It didn't really show us much. It, it, it you know, I need more uh, data to make better decisions. So what I decided to do was take those ratings and then create new ranges and call, well, I'm calling these the boroughs ratings. Instead of having a rating um, uh, based on the points, that takes these points and now we're looking at line segments. And then I divide it up into five ratings that then links up with what the borough engineer uh, defined. So what I'm calling rating one are those line segments that have a rating of one to one and a half. Rating two, as you can see, is 1.51 to 2.5. 
and so on and so forth. And so what this map is showing us, and I didn't symbolize it because it was just too much data, we have no rating fives, but that big red line, that's our only rating four line segment in the borough. So what I wanna do next is just flip through each rating just to highlight each of the roads. So rating one, these are the best roads in the borough. Those roads that are highlighted, the uh, unit block of Sabine, uh, 200 and 300 blocks of Elmwood, South Narberth and Rockland Avenue. Now we're getting into rating two. This is, these are the average roads. Now let's start talking about rating three and four. These are the roads that I am going to suggest the borough think long and hard about starting to reinvest in. These are the roads that have the most significant uh, damage, and these are the ones that are going to need the most immediate attention. So our recommendation is to complete, is to combine rating three and rating four, and the total estimated cost to repave both the rating three and four roads would be just under $800,000. That's your total square yards times $10. That's the, a, a good estimate as of right now. The investment schedule we're going to talk about in a minute, it needs to be determined by council. And we also recommend that the rescan of each pavement, meaning all of those dots generated, um, uh, council really should um, invest in a three year repavement, a uh, rescan of pavement. And um, through talking to our borough engineer, it's recommended that really the sweet spot for annual construction contracts really needs to be no less than $100,000. Any contract that would be less than that, it would be cost, it becomes cost prohibitive for the borough engineer's time, um, staff time, the permitting process, and you also have the uh, fear of not getting a quality paving contractor for smaller projects. So I wanted to zip through all of that data. And again, you know, if you're interested in seeing the meat and potatoes, all of the GIS data, send me an email. I'd be happy to uh, set up an in-person, you know, after Friday, of course, an in-person uh, meeting at council. And I could put it up on the screen and we could social distance and I can show you all of the nuts and bolts behind it if you're really into it. Long story short, we have the ability that, to then query not only just the rating of each of those line segments, but we could query within those ranges, like what are the worst uh, rating three roads, right? Because each line segment has its own uh, rating. And then we could also query it by road type. Say council wanted to repave uh, all of Conway Avenue. So we could query that out. We could estimate how much that repavement would cost, so on and so forth. Um, there is a time, so, oh, uh, the, so the first fact is that the borough is fiscally constrained. We don't have all the money in the world. We are not going to be able to reinvest in repaving all of the three and four roads, uh, investing $800,000 off the bat. So we're gonna have to think about this long-term and what is a good repavement plan reinvestment uh, schedule. Uh, the predominant funding mechanism that we are uh, suggesting to use is highway aid funds. And we are uh, recommending a $65,000 annual investment. Council, of course, has the ability to uh, consider using additional funds through other capital F funds, such as the capital fund or even the general fund. And that's up for discussion. If council wants to reinvest more than that $65,000, uh, they certainly can do that. Uh, the time sensitivity is another thing that we need to think about is that we're already well into paving season. And it's gonna be difficult for us to get into a pavement uh, contract this season. Um, first of all, we don't have, um, uh, um, you know, sixty-five thousand dollars is below that one hundred thousand dollar threshold again, um, and it's late in the season. It's going to be difficult for us to get that approval and get a quality contractor this year. It's not out of the realm of possibility as of yet, but each month that goes by, it's going to become more difficult and more difficult. The other thing I'd like council to think about while um, considering a reinvestment plan for repaving is that repaving is just one element of the broader infrastructure that's also included in sewer and stormwater and curbs and sidewalks. It would be a shame if council uh, decided to invest in a segment of road 
uh, to repave. And then a year later, the sewer and stormwater um, you know, fails and it needs to be uh, reinstalled, thus eliminating the benefit of repaving a road. So these, there are these other factors that need to be considered when determining which roads really should be at the highest level of a reinvestment. And as of right now, the roads are the only good qualitative data that we have um, for assessment. We're in conversations and discussions with the borough engineer regarding uh, a similar application to determine the status of our sewer and stormwater sewer system and curbs and sidewalks. So here we are, last slide. And I'm flying through, I understand. If you, if you want, I'll, I'll send this uh, presentation out to everybody also. And please feel free to contact me directly if you want further clarification at any time. So here's the decision point, and this is where I um, am, am bringing it to council. The first thing we need to talk about is funding. Does council support an annual dedicated highway aid fund investment of $65,000 a year? Or would council support that and additional dedicated funding amount to be determined by council? And what fund, capital F, those funds would come from? The next thing we need to consider is timing. You know, option one. Do we want to begin a biannual repaving plan to begin in spring 2021? That's next year. That would be the most ideal um, in, in talking with our borough engineer that would give us enough time to put a quality contract together. And we say biannual because that means we can combine the $65,000 a year into a $130 contract, $130,000 contract every two years. And so it's above that $100,000 threshold it would, um, it would be um, cost effective for that to happen. Um, it would be, uh, we would be able to uh, um, you know, attract a quality repaving uh, contractor as well. Option two, we can fund the repaving, repaving of rating four road segment, which is that uh, uh, the, the 100 block of Dudley Avenue. In 2020, we could do it this year. It would cost about $23,000 and then begin a biannual repaving plan next year. And that would be that $130,000 every two years. Option three would begin annual repaving plan in 2020, just using that $65,000 a year. Or the option four, begin that annual repaving plan plus additional funding. So here's the menu. Here's the idea. And here's the discussion that I would really like uh, council's insight on to take their temperature to see what levels of reinvestment in the critical infrastructure you're really willing to make. And that's everything. Thing. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Bob. Go ahead, Mona. Um, so, uh, I guess I mean I I was I'm glad you mentioned it because this is what I was wondering when you were talking is what about stormwater and sewer and it would be a shame to spend money on roads that we'd then have to tear back up to fix stormwater drains and sewer. So. I'm wondering, do you have any idea how soon we might be able to get a similar map or estimate for stormwater and sewer needs and how much that might cost to get that similar estimate so we could lay a map over the whole town with all of those needs together? Yeah, good question. And we actually had a uh, meeting with Eric Johnson, the borough's engineer last week, and we've asked him to uh, forward us a proposal about, and, and get, a, get us in contact with um, what, what systems they have to gather that data and what it looks like and if it would plug into our GIS and if so, how it would, as well as cost. So I'm expecting, you know, um, hopefully this week or next week, um, we can get something from Eric. Um, turnaround time, you know, it all depends on the system. I just don't have enough um, to um, you know, recommend how long that would take. Um, but by using that, you know, giving us a little more time, option one, uh, starting the beginning repavement plan next year would give us that time to build that data. And so in talking about this issue, if we decide to go and repave uh, one of the uh, ra uh, rating three and four, and we know just institutional wise that we know that the stormwater and sewer are in rough shape on one of the high priority three or four, we would make that game day decision and say, you know, we better not repave this right now because we need to reinvest in the sewer and or stormwater first and foremost. So, you know, stall this work 
understanding that both the sewer and stormwater are important in that up until we get that objective data, we have to truly rely on that institutional knowledge in the meantime. Thank you. Anybody else? Rob. Um, oh. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, Cindy. No, 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 go ahead, Rob. I Rob, just wanted to, to ask, uh, following on Mona, so when we say repaving, we're just talking about the, you know, the macadam, the asphalt, right? And not, um, does that include the striping is what I'm asking? So in other words, do we have to have our bike plan and our parking plan figured out for those segments as well? Or talk me through that. Yeah, sure. So that, you know, the bike plan and striping plan are also, are, are additional, you know, are add-ons um, that, that would be in addition to the sewer and stormwater uh, infrastructure. Striping is a little more easy because you can kind of remove it easier than, you know, digging up a street. Um, so I'm less um, worried about that in, in the greater sense of things. But this is really talking about not just really, this is just the uh, milling and overlaying of um, all of our roads. Okay. Cindy. Um, so Matt, I don't think there are, um, there's a better traffic calming tool than some potholes and a bit of a rough ride on a street. Do you anticipate once we do pave and have nice smooth roads that we're going to have to invest additional dollars in some traffic calming mitigation? I always believe that we should be investing in traffic calming measures. Uh, I believe even with potholes, watching um, the traffic pick up speed on Haverford Ave right next to the municipal building every day, it really has become a, a, a raceway. Um, I'm, I'm often surprised on how, how fast cars are going. And so, yeah, maybe initially um, the potholes do work as a deterrent, but my, I am seeing even on Wynwood uh, Avenue uh, that the cars are just going really, really fast. And so I am personally um, always at that bicycle and pedestrian standpoint, I'm always looking to slow the speeds down. And I think council really should consider um, dedicating some funding for continued um, uh, speed reduction in traffic calming. It's something that's not ever gonna go away. This is my former life being a transportation planner. Um, it, it, you know, it's never gonna go away. It, it's, it's a fight that you're always going to be fighting. And so if, if council wants to dedicate annual funds, it doesn't even have to be that much. You can get pretty creative with low tech solutions you know, whether they be temporary rumble strips or those sorts of things. Um, I think we should really start thinking of, uh, think about considering those elements. Oh, Matt, you're talking my language. I mean, this has been a battle I've had since I've been in the borough for 15 years. Um, and it just was, was not identified as a priority. Um, and I think, Cindy, just to tag on to your conversation there, I, I have two questions. My general question really relates to yours, Cindy. When you were talking about core municipal services, Matt, being sewer, stormwater, curbs, sidewalk, um, it seemed to me that also core municipal services includes the kinds of features that Cindy's referring to, that, you know, that she that she actually introduced in the complete streets investigation back when she was chairing, um, I believe, infrastructure um, several years ago. And so I wonder about how do you, is it practical in some way to hold the sort of bump outs and tree wells and stormwater features like bioswells and even some of the special features say intersection features of a, of a multimodal transportation plan that might be included with the biking, you know, good bike infrastructure, sort of all together with, with these, um, sort of in this basket of decision making. Because if there's a way to triage where the money's spent in relationship to where we intend to make significant infrastructure improvements, um, it's, I, I don't know, I guess I'd just sort of like to see it overlaid on the, on the same kind of analysis that you've done for paving. That's a comment. I'd like to hear your comments on it. But, but then more my second question more specifically, Matt, has to do with the repaving um, dollars and, the, and how you have imagine getting to every street in the borough over time. Um, in the olden days, like I think even as you know, before in the pre-Pico Aqua tear up of everything in Narberth, the streets 
every street in Narberth was being repaved every 10 years. So basically the management at the time would take all of the total number of miles, divide by 10, and then do that number about once a year. That's my recollection. Um, how does this plan differ, say, in cost or efficiency or in, in how does it improve on that? So one of the key, I see Sean uh, chomping at the bit there too, because he and I are of, uh, of like minds on this and that we, we don't want, you know, the goal of this is that we want the borough to continue to be in health, sound fiscal health. And we don't, are not in, the, uh, not in favor of borrowing money to do something, to complete a project that we have enough in our budget if we plan accordingly and do it in a segmented way. And if we look at a 10 year plan, if you divide up all of those roads and all of those roads don't necessarily need to be repaved every 10 years. And that's the beauty of having this data. Even if we focus on the bad quote, bad roads right now, that's $800,000 over a 10 year period. If you divide that only those bad roads, that would be an $80,000 a year investment. And we're suggesting $65,000 a year. And, you know, it would really uh, enable us to uh, be fiscally responsible, use objective data, and not put the borough in future financial trouble by borrowing for something that we really should be um, budgeting for. I don't know if uh, Sean, Sean did a lot of the um, fiscal analysis for this also, if he has anything he'd like to add. Yeah, and we, and we know that four years ago, 100% of the south side roads were repaved. So it'd be curious to see what the engineer's analysis, I'd like to sort of look again, if you wouldn't mind flipping back at the engineer's analysis of the south side in particular, because that was just 100% repaved four or five years ago. Yeah, and they're all. And you can see that, and there you can see the variability in wear and tear and or. Yep. So, so not all the roads are the same, is what you're saying. Yeah, and they're all coming into the same rating, and that was at a time that you know we were continuing past practice of um, you know when a, a utility was in to borrow money to repave. And in the meantime, our, you know, we've just gotten smarter with data collection and building and our fiscal, we've got our fiscal house in order. And we're really starting to develop these long-term planning tools that'll enable us to make better decisions now and in the future. And to your point about using these other things to add qualitative data to our decision-making, I'm all for it. This is just one element that we use, paving analysis. If we wanted, if we knew that you know uh, Windsor Avenue was being considered for complete streets, then maybe we would hold off on that until we had uh, more investment money available to do the entire thing that would include bump outs. Because this is th this plan here is only for mill and overlay. This doesn't take into account any other engineering for redesign, other construction, which you know costs are going to start escalating pretty quickly. Sean or others? Uh, Jeff Ben, I, I, I share your um, I share your concern about the the cost, Bob, and the sort of long term replacement schedule. It seems like to replace the roads that are below average, that are that are marked as you know current priorities in one way or another. That's fourteen years with uh, sixty five k a year, and by then, I mean some of the other roads are going to have eroded, right? I mean that's only half the roads in the borough. Uh, I, you know, I don't know for sure. I'm not a highway engineer, but I believe that if we were to do this plan year after, you know, every time we analyzed it, we would see more and more mileage becoming poor condition. I mean, this, this would not keep us current on maintenance. I suspect $65,000 a year does not seem like it would keep us current on, on road maintenance. So I think we're going to have to find another, uh, some more money for this in the budget. I, don't, I just don't think 65K cuts it um, annually. Yeah, Fred, you make a really good point about, you know, not thinking about what the degradation of other roads. And I kind of glossed over here, if you see on this slide, you know, the rescan of the pavement on a three year cycle to, you know, to see, to catch what segments have been repaved and then to also see what other road segments are 
trending worse or which ones are continuing to be in the same ratings. Because some, you know, like, you know, th those roads that get uh, more traffic are going to wear more quickly than those that don't. And so if you do that, if we do that on a three year cycle, we'll then start seeing, OK, how are those ratings changing over time? And I, I, I share your sentiment that $65,000 is not enough, but this is council's discussion and council's decision. And uh, we would certainly welcome more, more dedicated funding. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Go ahead, I always want to follow up on Fred's question because Fred, that's, that was uh, closely related to what I, what I had a question about was that, um, the, so the $65,000, can we go back to the last slide where you have the budgeting sort of the decision point? Yeah, thank you. Uh, right. So that's a, a, a high, a dedicated highway aid fund investment. So you're recommending that's the federal highway aid fund. Is that, do I, first of all, just, am I correct about that? No, that's state highway aid. State highway, sorry. So, so well, it might be from, from but state highway funds. So it's, we're talking about just taking funds from the state, from what we get a grant from the state, right? Basically, it's yeah. just, yeah. I want to make sure, I want to make sure I understand where the $65,000 a year fuels. comes it's from. Liquid, it's liquid fuels, right, um, Matt? Yeah, so. liquid fuel funds. come. They come from so, gas tax, a percentage of every uh, gallon okay. of gas pumped in the state gets put into a fund and based upon however many lane, lane miles, miles of, of right you get X amount per year. So we're talking about setting aside, dedicating a certain amount of that for this repaving program. Um, uh, re yeah. And I'm, I wanted to know if the $65,000 was a number that was dropped on our expenditures in previous years. If we've sort of, if that's, if that's what it's based on, um, I'm trying to figure out where the 65,000 comes from. And I also was just, I wanted to ask about the, the cash payout from Pico and Aqua and whether I, I guess it had been my impression that one of the reasons why we didn't just repave the roads then was we said, look, it would be smarter to wait until we have a plan and then apply some of these funds to that when we have a, when we have a plan to do this efficiently over time. And so I, I think I had assumed that we would be using some of those funds, distributing them and to, to supplement the highway aid fund investment so that we could have a maintenance schedule that would, be more likely to satisfy us as as being more likely to keep up with road degradation on an ongoing basis. So I'm I'm just asking where the sixty five thousand comes from, what our what our other funding options are, um, whether we actually still have some of the cash payout from Pico and Aqua that we can draw on. So Sean did the uh, financial analysis for the highway aid fund, and we get X amount of funds per year. You know, uh, repaving is one of the approved state expenditures for a highway aid fund, and as are other things. And so we look at all of the other things that are approved highway aid fund expenditures in a given year, and then looked at how much money we had left. And Sean's got a really snazzy spreadsheet that uh, you can play with the numbers, and it's dynamic to see if you want, you know, we can change that number and what happens to that highway aid fund, capital F. Um, you know, if we choose to spend, uh, invest more in an, uh, on an annual basis, then the highway aid fund goes broke sooner, right? And we, it, also, we don't want any of these funds to go broke. We would like to keep a cushion in all of these funds as sound fiscal practice. Um, you are correct in that there is money. The money that was, um, uh, you, that, that was taken from the utilities was put into the capital fund, capital F. And so council has that discretion to use that, uh, uh, the dollars that are in the fund to fund repavement. Okay, folks, it's getting late here. We have a lot to do. I want to just ask um, at this juncture, unless you were still in the middle of a thought there, Michelle, wave if you, if you still talk, if you still have a thought. No, no. Okay, so we, we are, um, let's just see. If we have agreement, do we support actually, let's talk about whether we support the base $65,000 a year first before we talk about a, a dedicating additional funding. Is anybody opposed to that? Okay, I don't, I don't hear anyone. I'll give a minute, a moment to unmute yourself or, okay. So then let's talk about, do we want to, do we want to as Fred suggests, um, allocate additional funding so that we get a higher level of uh, re, re, 
um, maintenance. And also um, that would then bring us closer to the possibility of doing an annual $100,000 contract. Fred, please. Fred. So I want to suggest that I think that given the, uh, the other things that we have going on, the PRP, you know, the uh, bike lane stuff that we go with the plan to do this next year. And so, that, you know, we have time to figure out an appropriate amount of funding, but you know, if we were, to, if we were to try to rush this, this year, you know, we might collide with some of our other projects. So until we have a better sense, I'm going to, I'm going to say that if we go with, you know, option two on the screen, uh, where are we? More like option one on this screen, um, begin the biannual repaving plan, begin spring 2021, you know, can you know, is it reasonable for us to, to do the repaving uh, next spring rather than trying to, to do it now? I, um, I understand the logic. Um, so are there any council members opposed to that, given the fact that we don't have terrible, terrible streets? We have streets that certainly need maintenance and attention, but they're not terrible, terrible. Is anybody opposed to that uh, proposal, waiting until spring 2021? That would allow us to let some. So, Fred, along with that, would would we be then letting the cash build up? We're we're saving sixty five thousand from this year's budget, and then combining that with next year's budget, so we have one hundred and thirty at that point. I mean, the, the highway aid fund is really constrained in what we can spend it on. So, I think that yes, that money would, that money's naturally going to be occurring, and it, mm -hmm. the repaving is a natural yes. So, yes, yeah, that's the answer. But to your point, Fred, I also think that we need to take that time to twenty twenty one to think about how can we then routinely dedicate funds to address issues of, tra of traffic calming. Along well, with that, I'm I mean, have that a, a dedicated almost budget line to say that, you know, per our comprehensive plan, we're dedicated to a walkable, walkable, bikeable community and that there's going to be routine maintenance along with the paving that goes along with that. And, and that's a conversation I'd ask to have go back to the infrastructure committee because traffic calming can mean a lot of things and can be done in a lot of ways, you know, including street trees, stormwater, you know, bump out stormwater management, even multi multimodal infrastructure also can accomplish lots of traffic calming. So it's, it seems like it, it really is your, uh, it's your, it's all in your concern there, Fred, isn't it? In the in infrastructure committee. So should we let, I mean, Sean also hasn't weighed in on this. Uh, I don't know if we need to let him. Uh, are, you, are you being, uh, do you have something, Sean? The thought I had uh, that wave passed a little little ways ago. I just wanted to mention that um, you know a ten year repaving cycle would be really expensive and not really sustainable, and that a well managed roadway should be lasting you longer than that. And we don't know exactly how long our roads last because we've never had never taken this kind of information in and put it in and measured against other information we've taken at known time intervals so we can we can judge the dynamics of paving in the borough i think what you would find or what you would find is a pretty consistent overlap between the roads that were used the most and the roads that deteriorated the quickest um, but we won't know that until we start until we start down this road. No, no uh, pun intended. And to answer Michelle's question, the sixty-five thousand a year is um, what we can spare, so to speak, out of the highway aid fund without exhausting its resources over a 10, 15 year um, horizon. And keep in mind that the what what enables that dollar value to be sixty-five thousand a year, not something a lot lower. Is that council made the made the investment in um, LED streetlights, which are going to reduce our electrical costs from seventy eight down to about forty two, forty three thousand dollars a year once those are installed. So we'll start realizing those savings as soon as those lights go on, which I suspect will be sometime uh, this year or at the very latest um, early next year. But you know, that's a different topic of conversation. This is a really great conversation. I've taken a lot of notes and I really appreciate everyone's input on this so far. Everyone's had really good things to say and it's helped us figure out, helped me figure out what we need to do to tune the, tune the work that we're gonna keep doing on this issue. Okay, terrific.
Is it a, does anyone need me to, to um, summarize what we, what I think I heard us decide? I think we, we, I think we decided that we all support annual dedicated highway fund investment of $65,000 a year in our roads. And that at this time we would select option one to begin a biannual paving plan to be one. And I'm assuming that the folks who live on the 200 block of Dudley Avenue would see their road repaved at that time and could pretty much, since they have the worst road in the borough, they have that fine distinction, they would be one of the first to get uh, get re remade, repaved. Does that sound about right, Mr. Manager? <laughs> since we called their, their road out, I wanna mention that help is on the way. Uh, yeah, am I unmuted? Yes. Sorry, I, I, my, my mouse went crazy there. Yes, and that's the whole point of this exercise is to help um, council make good decisions that can be prioritized in that way. And then, and then the residents can have a reasonable expectation of what will happen. Yes. Relief is on the way. Okay, and thank you so much, Mr. West. Thank you so much um, for a, an excellent presentation and for, for using, you know, for helping us have data-based kind of thinking and decision-making. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address council. And I just also just wanted to add that, you know, every year or biannual, uh, the, the roads that are recommended for repaving will certainly be up and be uh, presented to council every time we do it also. It's not like a, a, a plan that we're, that the administration is going to put together. And we're just going to go start paving uh, roads that, you know, council will see the roads that are going to be up uh, every other year and we'll uh, vote to approve that as well. Again, thank you for the time. Have a good night. Okay, thanks, Matt. Okay, folks, it's 846. Um, we're going to item five, letter B, COVID-19 yellow phase re re uh, response, Mr. Metric. Oh, and Matt, would you please toss the hosting back to me, please? Sorry about that. I started talking without unmuting. Um, the mayor addressed some of these comments in her, uh, some of the yellow phase reopening uh, decisions that the emergency management team had made with the EMC um, in her comments earlier this evening. And I think that um, I won't reiterate those, but we are going to start communicating those um, steps and uh, changes out to uh, uh, the community and as, as soon as possible. And uh, we also are going to continue the dialogue with our downtown businesses to see what um, um, support the borough can lend to them for outdoor dining, for outdoor retail, for, for creating more space to, to facilitate their their survival really in, in our downtown. We had a really robust conversation with, with them last week and I thank Ed Ridgeway for organizing that. Um, at this time though, I don't, uh, um, I don't know if council wants to get into more of those details uh, at this moment or if that's something we want to um, revisit again at the emergency management meeting on Monday. Why don't, why don't we just move on for now? I would just echo what you said at business meeting a bit both at the emergency management meeting this week and at the at the Narbrook Business Association meeting um, Sean everybody talked about how you know we, we want to support the borough wants to support the businesses in particular the restaurants who've suffered during this the closures um, by providing some borough accommodation that we could control and give to the restaurants to use and the details of that you know, will need to be worked through the businesses, the restaurants are planning to open for street side um, dining on, on Friday, but we don't have to have this, what, whatever accommodation we're going to create for them implemented by Friday. And so I think council and the public should know that that, that will improve and improve over time. We'll probably be in the yellow phase for a while. And even after we get to the green phase, it doesn't mean life's back to normal. We may still need to observe social distancing in, in, in the outdoor dining context. So um, if, it's, if it's I may, I, I yeah. just want to head up. I've been receiving a, a, a ton of 
letters from constituents who've been requesting that we provide open space, various areas of open space for the restaurants. Um, that was raised, I just wanna uh, say out there, that was raised with the restaurants. However, the restaurants didn't find that open space that wasn't right attached to their, their premises to be very helpful. And so they actually declined. The, the vast majority of the restaurants uh, in, in the borough declined that offer. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Andrea. Let's move on. Item um, C, Pollution Reduction Plan, Mr. Metric. You're still muted, John. He's smiling and shaking his head. There he is. Yeah, it's probably not going to be the last time I do that. Um, Members of the Infrastructure Committee and the Borough Engineer have been working together on uh, the new draft of the Pollution Reduction Plan. Uh, we were ironing out some details that um, made, made, a, made a shift between what our plan was going to be, what we, what we thought our plan was going to be, and um, uh, what our plan is now, which is which I will uh, let Eric speak more to that in a, in a second here, but I, I want to say to you all, as uh, council members, we just talked about paving uh, and to the community as well. We are also talking about uh, stormwater systems and stormwater management as another core municipal function. And this pollution reduction plan is an incredible commitment on part of the borough to designing streets that not only are safe, calm traffic, move cars, but are safe for people crossing, people walking next to on sidewalks, street trees, people on bikes, and also now treating stormwater. So I'm looking forward to the future where Narbus roads all, all are, des are designed in ways to treat these multiple goals. And our pollution re reduction plan is a commitment um, to that process that's in line with our comprehensive plan goals. And I'm really proud of, of what we've been able to put together. Are you, is the borough engineer planning to make a presentation on this, Sean, at this time, or? Uh, I am here to, to speak to it a little bit, yes. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you everyone for uh, having me tonight. So um, I'll keep this relatively brief. Uh, you know, the plan speaks largely for itself. I'll just bring out a few of the points um, and then uh, I'll open up for questions. But just to summarize where we are, uh, you know, the original, there was an original PRP plan uh, that was developed in and around 2017. Um, and that was originally that was submitted to DEP and there was feedback uh, that was gained from that. Uh, and, you know, how we got from seven, 2017 to now, uh, there was a long review process by DEP. Uh, there was a long process of going back and forth with them. And we ironed out a lot of um, their comments at that point. Uh, we had circulated a, a revised version back in the fall uh, of the PRP. And since that time, we've been working uh, with the Infrastructure Committee and with the uh, Environmental Advisory Committee uh, to really iron out and develop a, a plan of how and what systems we're going to implement to meet the sediment reduction goal. Um, and the first item that I want to point out is there an upside to all this the new land development that uh, is going to be coming into the borough is you're able to leverage the stormwater management they are funding and installing as part of their development for sediment reduction. Uh, so we're able to meet a, a chunk uh, of the sediment reduction at no cost to the borough. So that is um, kind of an important piece to remember. And then beyond that, you know, where we started looking at where else can we uh, install projects that will get that reduction. And as you well are well aware, Narberth is uh, a very dense, uh, you know, inner suburb uh, of and a very urbanized area, and you have limited uh, open space. So, uh, you know, in the case where you have a more open municipality, you're able to you know, leverage your uh, open space and, and, and redevelop stormwater basins and that kind of stuff to meet sediment reduction. But in this case, you know, the places that the borough owns, you have your municipal complex when the sports fields and you have your public right of ways. So focusing in on that, uh, you know, and also as Sean was mentioning, kind of integrating in 
the other goals and objectives of the borough uh, with regard to uh, wanting to see more green infrastructure, wanting to uh, you know provide traffic calming, uh, and really reevaluate how you use your streets. Uh, we've developed uh, a series of plans that will really connect with that. So the first one is uh, installing various stormwater uh, bump outs. Essentially, they would be at the location of the existing inlets uh, built along the side of the road, and they would allow us to filter water uh, before it gets to the stormwater system. So to get our sediment reduction, uh, provide a narrowing at certain points of the road, which calms traffic. Um, and we can they can be installed really um, anywhere in the borough where water is flowing. So we can really integrate that directly into you know our other uh, plans for the streets. And then the other system that we're really looking at is your municipal complex. And that would be a combination of taking water from the library, taking water from the um, municipal building, uh, also off of your basketball courts and tennis courts, uh, and that could be integrated with any kind of uh, improvements that would be completed there. And then also taking water off of the parking lot. Um, the, par the parking lot would be a little less glamorous. It's more of just an inlet filter system that collects the water, uh, but the rest really is kind of a green type system. Uh, that would be proposed. Um, and really where we are at this point in the process is you have the revised plan and we're headed towards resubmitting it to DEP um, at this point to get the sign off on that the plan is uh, adequately, it is found feasible to DEP uh, and allow us to go forth to the next stage. Um, but before we can submit it, we need to have a 30 day public advertising period. Um, so council uh, would have to authorize that period. And then uh, we accept comments and we would be able to submit at that point. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, uh, either now or I can also be available uh, afterwards. Um, I'm, I'm available. Questions? Thank you so much, Eric. Oh, yep, wait, no problem. Fred has a question. Well, it's not okay. a question. I'll just uh, point out that since so many of these improvements, um, so these improvements would need to be made on a five-year basis after we approve it, and a lot of them are on the streets, right? They're going to be, there's a couple buffers on um, on some green buffers on some streets, and mm -hmm. then there's a bump outs. That's why I'm, I strongly suggested that we wait on the repaving to uh, figure out, you know, where we're going to do these improvements, um, among other things. Anyway. Thanks, Fred. Thank you very much, Eric. No problem. Thank you. Attention. We are at item D, Narbeth Planning Commission revised 5A amendment. Mr. Bressy, I'm going to unmute you, I think. Unless you can unmute yourself. I think I'm unmuted. Oh, great. Super. Hi, hi, hi Todd. Welcome. Sure, you for making time for me to speak this evening. Um, I'm reporting to you from Hawk, Fox Hall Lane, which is out of power right now. Oh. So if you guys could take care of that, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> I thought it was Halloween. I, I don't know I don't how Fred's got it. I myself, so. <laughs> Bob, what, how would you like to proceed? Like, why don't you, um, if you would, please, we, we have your text, we have the, the, the copies you sent us. Could you please just summarize in perhaps a bullet form and as plain, in plain English, if you're able, will you do speak plain English, um, where we are with the 5A amendments that, that the Planning Commission has been working very diligently on, actually for many months, I think, mm -hmm. and so... You know, I think I think actually starting with kind of an overview where you started, where you've come to, and then and then the particular details that are new for us tonight. Um, okay. In preparation for the introduction at the business meeting in two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Um, in in January, we submitted uh, to Borough Council um, some proposed uh, zoning changes for the five A zone that were uh, intended to address. Um, some immediate issues we had um, observed based on um, the development applications we had reviewed over the last year. So um, 
during the winter, we became aware of a few other issues about the zoning code that uh, arose through um, the zoning hearing board actions. And so we quickly um, added in a few additional proposed amendments. Um, Borough Council reviewed those in February, I believe, or Mar March, I guess, um, and uh, posed some questions to the Planning Commission, which we considered at our April meeting and then reported back to Council in a letter on April 28th, responding to the questions you had. Um, based on that, um, I've been working with the Borough Solicitor uh, on finalizing uh, language that can be um, provided to you for consideration at your business meeting. So I'm not sure what, where Mr. Walker stands on those, on those at this point, but we spoke as recently as yesterday to kind of make edits and things. Um, meanwhile, in the, win in the winter and spring, um, we, we uh, embarked on a broader review of uh, the 5A zone of downtown. Um, and we looked at a couple of um, basic issues. Uh, we, continued to look at building heights. We looked at um, building scale, frontages. Uh, we looked at the question of preserving retail and office viability. Uh, because of resident concerns, we looked more closely at parking. Uh, we looked at station circle and at preservation issues. And we will be, we, we on, on uh, our meeting this Monday, we completed that work and we'll be submitting a full report to council soon. However, in that work, we also identified a few which, which what we consider to be relatively modest additional uh, proposals for changing the zoning code. Uh, I quickly wrote them up yesterday after our meeting and they were submitted to you this morning. Um, so those would be uh, yet another uh, round of changes that would be incorpor incorporated into what is now an omnibus amendment <laughs> that the solicitor is preparing. Those items which are new um, uh, relate to two issues. Uh, one is, um, they relate to parking, and the other is they relate to further um, um, design guidelines, so to speak, for mixed use buildings and for commercial buildings. Um, the parking um, 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 recommendations, uh, I, I will say that we, uh, we did do a bit of research. You know, a lot of people came to our uh, planning commission meeting and expressed concern about the number of um, spaces that developments were providing. So we embarked on a research on what exactly is known in the field about parking in areas like Norberth and what are, what is, what are some comparable municipalities doing. And the short of that was that um, um, evidence is showing that parking requirements in areas like Norberth for mixed use buildings are highly overestimated. Um, um, by the um, planning and engineering community. And in recent years, they've been trending downward to the point now where um, a, a, the standard, for example, for residential development is about one unit, one parking space per unit. Um, we in particular looked at Lower Marion's recently passed zoning code. And while its base uh, requirements are um, about two spots per residential unit in its town and village centers, they offer a lot of credits and the effective rate is one space per unit. Um, which both of those, the one space per unit is a little bit higher than what we've been uh, approving in Narberth. Um, so um, we looked at that and we um, um, considered, because there are a lot of factors like the nature of the transit oriented district, the nature of the transit service, that it would, that it would not be unreasonable to increase the parking requirements slightly um, for residential development in Narberth. And the way we have recommended doing that is by keeping the base requirements the same, but by um, eliminating the credit we give to properties for um, uh, on-street parking, uh, for the, the on-street spaces next to their building, uh, reasoning that in a 5A district, those spaces really should be counted for the general good, not for the good of a development um, and to eliminate a credit we offer currently for one space per use because it is duplicative of exemptions that we offer. Um, several of the approvals we've given have allowed applicants to count newly created on-street spaces towards their requirements and we felt we should not permit that any further. Again, 
on street spaces should be counted towards the public good and not towards the satisfying um, development requirements. And then for the largest developments, to add a requirement for visitor parking um, for larger developments, say one for every every 10 minutes. Uh, so you think those are, are actually pretty marginal changes at the edges, but I think they, they bring us a little bit closer to the standard we're seeing of one space per unit as opposed to about 0.8 or 0.9 spaces per unit, which we had been approving. Um, so and there's one other parking change we discussed. One of the topics residents have asked us to consider is whether our code um, unintentionally gives preference to residential development over office or professional space development. And there's a concern that um, some of our office space might be displaced for residential uses. Um, and so we looked at that and, and, um, and are recommending that we provide, we currently provide a blanket parking exemption for non-residential uses for the first 2,500 square feet of non-residential use. Um, we're recommending we split that into two parts. Uh, 2,500 square feet of retail uses can be exempt and 2,500 square feet of office or professional uses can be exempt. Uh, again, we, we think this is a small change at the margins, but what we are interested in doing is trying to equalize a little bit, better choice between uh, residential and office space and not have the parking requirements be a determining factor. So those are the changes, uh, the new changes we are recommending in regard um, to, um, to parking. Um, in terms of um, building design, um, you know, we've spent a lot of time and we've discussed with council the, the issue of, of storefront widths um, and the scale of the width of buildings. Um, we also reevaluated how the code uh, treats um, um, the vertical dimensions of buildings, the different levels of building, like the bottom of a building, the windows, the signs, the roof line. And we did that by doing a, um, a study of uh, all the storefronts on Haverford Avenue and sort of drawing them and measuring them and trying to understand how they were really composed. And we felt that, uh, we feel that we would like to recommend um, a, uh, um, a tightening up of, of the uh, facade requirements for um, mixed use and commercial buildings. Uh, currently, we define a base band, uh, a window band, and a cornice band. Uh, and we would like to further define a uh, signage band, which would be above the windows of a, of a shop front, and um, to de define for mixed use buildings an upper story window band. Um, and essentially what we would like to do is simply in our drawings that we have in the code and the text of the code, uh, call those out as bands that have um, design requirements as well. The goal really is to articulate requirements that are general, but in keeping with what we see on the street now. And I think that um, in overall our goal is to um, encourage people who are designing buildings to pay more attention to those features. I think that um, in, pra in a practical sense, what would happen is what happened with the review of 203 Haverford, where if you followed that uh, month after month, the applicant came back and revised their facade designs to be more in keeping with the patterns that already exist in the borough by eliminating large, large, uh, um, reducing the amount of space that was, dedicated, that was designed with large plate glass windows and, and replacing those areas with um, smaller traditional windows. Um, I think we learned from that experience and learned that we need to express a little more uh, clearly what our, um, what our interests are there. Um, we did discuss the planning commission whether we were inhibiting the freedom of design um, and we felt that, we, that what we are proposing does not go any further than the requirements that are in the code already for other parts of the building. We're not, we're not recommending we introduce new, new ideas into the regulation. It's sort of it's just covering more of the facade than we, than we cover right now. And we think that the recommendations we're making are, are, are pretty much along the lines of what 
has already happened in practice in the discussion of buildings that have been that have been reviewed. So those are the two new two things that we are working to develop language for and would like to include in that that omnibus ordinance. I hope I've been succinct and clear, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Todd. I have, I have one small question. Uh, just because I was just, what is a punched, what, what do we mean by a punched window here? Because it's used with, twice in the memo. <laughs> <That's very laughs> like, term, and we will work with uh, Mr. Walker to come up with, with more appropriate language. Okay, for all right, good. I was making, I wanted to make sure we weren't gonna just simply, introduce simply, a term in there. No. No worries, it's you're on the opposite it. Of a, sheet of a plate glass window. It's a, okay. it's a, it's a window that has a lot of shadow line. Yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. So my, that, I just had a question, but that's fine. Sounds like you're already all over it. You know what, that you're going to work with John on that. So the only question that I really have left, and I'm, I'm going back to this, I'm going back to this facade restriction, but not, not for the reason that you think. Um, you know, I was when I was concerned about this reduction of the facade uh, maximum from 130 percent of the average on the block down to 115. Uh, I was concerned for a couple of reasons. Excuse me, just was, to be clear, we're talking about the 3A, 3B, and 3C. 3A, 3B, 3C. Yeah. Okay. Um, and but we've already talked about this, and I, I was in the meeting where you talked about it again. I know you guys gave this like fulsom consideration, and I, I, I appreciate the reasoning, and it's it's all good. My my concerns were twofold. I was a little afraid that we would wind up that we hadn't sort of done an analysis to see if it was restricting things to the point where, say, we might wind up with a, a lot of increasing existing nonconformities, right? Because we have a lot of variability on our blocks. What if what if increasing what if decreasing the decreasing the maximum facade size to 115 would 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 make like half the houses and you know in, in some in some areas of the borough be non-compliant under our code? I didn't I didn't want to see that, and we didn't have an analysis of that. And my other concern was about multifamily and the effect on the possibility of multifamily developments that are permitted within those zones. Um, so to that end, I went through all the raw data that we had from the county, and I figured out that, in fact, the, the effect on nonconformities is not, not what I was afraid of. So that's a big relief. But in going through the data from the county, what I came to realize is that, let's, let me backtrack, I'm going out of order. I know that not everybody follows the zoning code with the intensity that I do. So let me just, you know, the, there's this thing, there's table 14, right? Table 14 is in our appendix and it gives anybody who wants to do a development, a, a, a data set of what the average facade is on each block in the borough, right? Um, and for 3A, 3B, 3C zones, that's where we have this average facade restriction for development. And block is defined in our code as sort of all the houses on one side of the street, on the street segment between intersections. So say the 100 block of Conway evens would be a block, odds would be another block. So we've known for a while now that the table 14 does not divide those facade averages by block. It, it averages all both sides of the street in together. We've known that was a problem. And, and I know the planning commission is intending to fix that. But when I was looking really closely at the raw data, I discovered that there are more problems than that in table 14, significantly more problems. Um, it appears there's about, there's about 1,008 uh, records in there. There should be about 1,200 um, in those zones for single family twin, uh, basically the building types that are covered by this. So there's, there's, there's some streets and there's some data that's just not there at all. Even within the 1,008 records that are there, um, about almost 300, about 296 were missing facade data. So we just have a zero. Okay. So that's, 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 the data is just missing. So you've got about 41% of the data that should be in the table isn't there. Um, that alone would make me feel like we are better off for this interim period of time before the county is able to update table 14, pulling it out of the code rather than leaving data that is that inaccurate in there for people to rely on since we're going to be needing to insert a new table 14 in the future anyway, we're going to need to revisit that. I think we would be better off pulling that out at this time. Nothing in the code refers to table 14. And what we would do in, in the absence of having a table 14 would be that applicants would have to do the take their own measurements according to our code. And we could verify them until we have an accurate table 14. I hate to leave data in there that is that off base that people can rely on because 
I mean, none of us have the time to go through it and see exactly what the implications of that are, but it, 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 it could be, could be bad. I mean, it could be could lead us to have to have to permit a project that we wouldn't want to permit, possibly, or wind up having to argue about it. So um, I was going to ask if we could have a discussion about just pulling Table 14 out altogether until we can fix the data. There's also some questions about whether even the facades that are measured in there were measured according to the terms of the code. That is to say, including all the the the. Uh, sort of the frontage within six feet of the frontage line, you know, within six feet back and also sort of extending up to the maximum height of the building. It's not clear when I'm looking at it, I, I think that it may not have been measured strictly. The county's data may not have been measured strictly to the specifications in our code as well. So I think there's a, lo a lot of indicia that it's not accurate and I'd rather pull table 14 and um, put in an accurate one at a future time So. Should I respond? Oh, if you would, yeah. If you have any thoughts on that, I mean, I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts. I just think better safe yeah. than sorry. Thoughts, but the, the one uh, flaw where there were a lot of data sets with zeros in them, I, I don't think I was aware of that. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, um, as a rule, as, as we discussed this idea somewhat not in the way you've presented it, as, as a general rule, we would rather have the borough provide that data not have to rely on calculations that might have to be checked. On the other hand, it, as an interim solution uh, to avoid problems that might actually be bigger, as you are you know, suggesting, inaccurate data might lead us to bigger problems. I think, um, I think it's reasonable to propose that we leave the table out until such time that we can provide accurate data. Um, I, think, I think we all know what our intent is here. Um, and I almost feel it's at the point where, you know, it's it's almost like, it's the kind of thing where I would, I'd say it, it might just be the borough solicitor's call, right? The borough solicitor would be able to assess what's the best way to do this if we don't feel we have accurate data. But I, but I think what you're suggesting is, is reasonable. If we don't have that, and if we intend to replace the table when we can get the correct data, then in the meantime, what you're suggesting is a reasonable fallback. Okay, thanks, Chad. Yeah, to maybe talk to John about that and see what he thinks. And if he has any questions about why, you know, I don't want to bore everyone, but I can show him sort of where this, yeah. all the zeros. <laughs> you can sort of see like, ooh, it's a lot. It's it was once I really started looking at it, I, I it was much different from what I was expecting. Um, so thank you for taking that into consideration. I appreciate that. Um, I, I wondered if the the one thing I didn't hear discussed when I when I sat in on the planning commission meeting I guess it was gosh it was February or March when you guys really talked about this in detail was about the effect that this could have on the the possibility of of constructing a multifamily home in the three A three B and three C zones where they are permitted and I think that multifamily housing is something that we put in our code pursuant to the idea that it does meet some goals for affordable housing for um, uh, environmental reasons for efficiency. I think that it's something. It's not a housing form we want to discourage, and um, there is already a, a fairly stringent site requirement for family multifamily homes. You have to have at least three thousand square feet per family, so per family unit for that building on your site. So that that means that multifamily homes can't be crammed onto tiny sites anyway, and there are already setbacks and such forth. I'm, I'm not sure that it that it seems like very sound policy to restrict the facade of a multifamily home to just 115% of what, say, a, a detached single family home would be on most blocks in Narberth, if we are in fact serious about permitting that, that housing type to be constructed. So the question would be, are these roles appropriate to the multifamily home? Yeah. How, right. I know that's not something that you took up at planning commission. I'm sorry to spring it on you now. It was something I had mentioned in the meeting and then kind of forgotten it, but kind of dropped Drop through the cracks, but I mean, given given you know the 115 percent of the average facade is it's kind of yeah you know, it, that Im imposes a, a good deal of uniformity, which is you know which is which is fine. I think that meets our goals on the whole. But if we want to permit, if not encourage, maybe not encourage, but at least certainly give a fair playing field to multifamily form types, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure that it's that it that it makes sense to include that building form in this restriction? Would it be possible? I mean, I don't know if that's uh, something that you had thought about. 
Uh, I didn't hear yeah, the discussion yeah, at planning yeah, commission, but no, um, at this point, and, and I mean, we'd be happy to talk about it at a future meeting, but we won't be meeting until July. Um, it, it's a reasonable question. And all, and all I can say is we'd be happy to take it up at a future meeting. Um, in, in regard to this amendment, I, you know, I, I think that um, we we're quite aware that our role is to advise council and, you know, council takes our advice into consideration and sometimes makes its own tweaks on things. And so if that were a tweak you wanted to suggest, you know, I think that would be the appropriate way to approach it right now. Matt, I wanted to know what anybody else on council sort of has had, uh, what, what your thoughts are, because I mean, I think if you think about trying to put a three or four, say, say a three family multifamily home and, and put it on a block where maybe you have a lot that's large enough, but you can't build it in any reasonable way because between your, your rear setbacks and your height restriction, and then on top of it, you're, you're being required to stay within the form of other, of existing detached family homes you're, with the facade that, that that's within a very narrow band of what the average is on that block. I mean, I think it, it could have the effect of making it really impossible to build multifamily homes in those, in those districts. I tend to agree with you on that detail Michelle, and um, just for this evening, for the purposes of this agenda, we were kind of gonna just stick with the 5A discussion and then um, of the discussion of these 5A tweaks that, that Todd was presenting. So I'm wondering if there's- Okay, well, one problem is that we're gonna have a, we're gonna be voting, I think we're gonna be looking to vote on an ordinance at the business meeting next month, right? Which would include, I think, I think would be the omnibus, this would be an omnibus zoning ordinance. Introduce, an, we're planning to introduce it in two weeks. So this would be, I mean, I wonder if you can just, we can look at that offline and then discuss okay. the table in two weeks. And it, I'm okay. we want to write in that exclusion, I think, and the other council members agree we could, we could do it then um, for, you know, for multifamily. Um, Fred has a comment or question for Todd. Fred, you're muted, Fred. My turn to do that. Okay. Um, just a quick question about the actual buildings. So it seems like if we're eliminating the bonus for these on street parking spaces, now they have, then maybe the developers aren't going to value them. Is there any concern that they might eliminate on street parking spaces? I mean, do we, do they have a penalty for removing any on street parking spaces? Um, Cause suddenly they're not going to, they're not going to have any value for the developers if we, you know, if we remove that bonus that they're getting? Um, well, it's not really a bonus. It's just that um, it's, it's a credit. Um, um, you, you know, I, I think that, um, and I don't know if Eric is still on the uh, call or not Eric Johnson, but I think it's almost a separate issue. I, I don't think the borough, because the borough owns the right of way where the parking spaces are. Eric's gone to bed. Sorry. I think the borough would have to agree to reduce, to eliminate uh, parking spaces uh, on a street. I, I, I don't know that that's the developer's call. Usually what happens is they reconstruct that part of the street because it gets all torn up during the construction process and they have to put it back the way it is. But we have two situations uh, on uh, Forest Avenue and on Essex Avenue where because the properties are being reconfigured, when the street is rebuilt, there will actually be new parking spaces on the street. As the Rickland site is, you know, because of the way it works, people pull in and park across the curb, that'll go away. And so there'll be new metered parking spaces on the street. And I, I think that those spaces come there because that's what the borough requests or requires when they rebuild the street. And I don't, I don't think the developer gets to decide that. But what they did do is they turned around and said, well, since we're adding those four spots, can we count them for our property? We didn't really have a way of, I mean, it was a, you know, that, that there's not a rule that says to do things one way or the other there. So what we'd like to do is prevent that from occurring. Yeah, I'm saying I'm, I'm not sure that was a coincidence that those parking spaces magically appeared when it seemed like they might get credit for them. So, you know, I'm okay with this rule, but I think we'd want to make it clear that, you know, we're, you know, we, we expect developers to retain the on-street parking that's already there. That's, uh, that's my point. Okay. Yeah, well, I will I will just, certainly agree with that. Yeah. Or produce more in the, in the instance of the gas station rent, um, site as well at Forest and, and Haverford. Um, when it was a gas station, 
we, we, when the use was changed from gas station to gym, we, we picked up four parking spaces there, short-term parking spaces. I think Rod, we want to go to Rob. Uh, Todd, I just wanted to ask about the, the parking um, adjustments that you're, you're proposing. Um, do you have specific dimensions for these spaces or is, it, is the size of a parking space standard in the code? Can you help me with that? Because I, I've been thinking, can we shrink some of the parking spaces? Do they need to be the same size that they are? Um, um, it's just been a question I, I've had. Yeah. So the answer is the first thing, part A, yes, there's a standard space. There's a, sp there's a standard uh, dimension. Um, and it's actually, um, it's in the subdivision and land development ordinance, um, not necessarily in the zoning code. It's, it's tricky. They're in both places sometimes. And one of the things we're working on now is an updated subdivision and land development ordinance, which will sort out what belongs there and what belongs in the zoning code. Um, the question, what we ultimately approve usually is a nine by 18 foot spot, which is slightly smaller than the kind of suburban standard spot, which is usually I think, 10 by 20. So we tend to have slightly smaller spots. The, the problem we have is that actually cars are still getting bigger. Um, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, and so it's hard, to, it's hard to think about how spots could be smaller. But that is a conversation that we, we will have when we update the saldo. What's, what's, you know, is that standard correct or could it be changed? Okay, thank you. So I just want to say at this point that if, if council members have, say, alternative ideas to the, the, those that Todd has presented, um, when John Walco um, finishes his current, the draft he's currently working on for this omnibus amendment, um, I, think, I think you could come prepared with some markups to present as, alternative, as alternatives, um, you know, and maybe um, if it's okay with you, Todd, maybe anyone who has an idea like that could pick your brain. And oh, of course, I'm always open to that. With you. Um, I'll have you know, I'll, I'll return your call as quickly as I can. Bob, or can I? And I think uh, we're going to Michelle. Is that right? Oh. Is I had it. I had a hand raised. Thank you. Okay. Um, Todd, I actually have um, a, a part of your letter highlighted because I was going to reference it during my FNA uh, report. And I'm wondering if perhaps I can just read it for the good of the public and ask you to comment now. Bob, does that work for you? Yeah, it's, I, that, I think, um, does anyone object? I'm just going to do that out of order. So super. Okay. Share with uh, us uh, now uh, while Todd's like while Todd's here to respond. Why, why Todd's here? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, and I'll elaborate on that. Do you mind, Todd? Do you have time for a minute? This I'm is I'm here at your pleasure, here. Mr. Chairman. So <laughs> wait, wait one moment here, Cindy. I just want to make sure. Let's close out this topic first, Todd. If you could just stay here with us for a minute, and let's just of let's complete this this agenda item because I think that may just take us off in another direction. We'll be ready to go off to our committee meeting reports. Um, is there more to say about the 5A, the specifically the, the parking and the, the design standards that Todd presented tonight? Okay, so then thank you so much, Todd, for all that work that you've been doing and ongoing and um, we'll, see you, we'll see you next time. So Cindy, yeah, share, share those thoughts with us now and then we'll do committee reports next. Okay, um, so, so just as kind of a, a brief review and context, um, with COVID-19, FNA and the council was saying, how can we best support our businesses at this time? And we were thinking about where would we have sources of money and then where, where would those funds go to best support economic development and the businesses? And conversations we had with both the um, NBA saying, you know, how could we support you and businesses um, with someone who actually does consulting with business improvement districts all really led to support what Todd writes now in his report um, with the NPC, which is a, a need to really um, identify how we can recruit retail. And, and, and so we've, we've kind of like triangulated a need here, right? Like both the NBA, both an outside consultant and our Narberth Planning Commission said the same thing. And Todd, I'd like to maybe just read for the good of the public um, 
a part of your paragraph and ask you to maybe give us a little light and to say that both the NBA and Todd have been invited to um, our June FNA meeting so we could talk about this a little more, but why we have you. Um, you say, in regard to the general retail environment, NPC reiterates its recommendation that the borough retain a Main Street manager whose focus is on retail recruitment and retention. While Narberth residents enjoy the mix of business and scale of businesses that we have now, and this I think is the most important part, Todd, that you say so beautifully, we cannot simply will the retail district we want to existence or survival and marketing and promotions are not enough in and of themselves. Um, th this to me really just kind of underscored our commitment of how we could strategically use business funds. I'm sorry, any additional funds that we have to support businesses to really reflect what we identified in our comprehensive plan. And so very clearly here in your Narva's Planning Commission funds report. That we have to support businesses to really reflect what we identified in our comprehensive plan. And so very clearly here in your Narva's Planning Commission so funds report. That we have to support businesses to really reflect. I'm getting some really bizarre feedback, Bob. I don't know if you all can hear it. I did hear it. I heard it. I'm looking for where it's coming from. I think somebody else was speaking. No, I think I was hearing Holly me. Holly is Holly is muted now. I think yeah, you were she, hearing it. Through Holly Don Farrell there for a moment. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Todd, can you can you speak to that? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, um, nobody on the Narberth Planning Commission is an expert in small businesses, retail, restaurants. So um, um, there are others who know that field better than we. But what we um, so we know what we don't know. <laughs> And what we know is that the, what we do know is that the, the survival of a business district like Narberth's is really um, influenced a lot by the macro conditions in the retail environment um, that, um, that um, we can't necessarily control. Um, we also know that almost any successful environment you're in, whether it is a retail environment in King of Prussia, uh, or a you know, historic district or a theme park, they're all very centrally managed and they're managed to the point where there are um, very conscious efforts to get, to find, to recruit, to incentivize, to obtain the kinds of businesses that you think you need to have the proper mix to create the place you want. Um, those kinds of mixes don't happen by accident. And so we feel that the, the Planning Commission has discussed this many times and we feel that the borough, at least in our experience, has made great strides with the marketing and promotion of the events. But what we've lacked is, is the ability to target the kinds of businesses that we think are anchors and that we think we need and to develop strategies for either cultivating them or retaining them. Um, and we, we know that if we wait for the broader market to try to supply those businesses to us, um, they won't, it won't. Um, and that there needs to be a conscious effort and maybe some very out of the box solutions to have them here. So that's, that's the thinking there. Thank you. And the Norworth Business Association very clearly said too, we know what we don't know and what we don't know and have the skill set for is business recruitment and, and retention and grant writing. So what we'll do at FNA is really kind of triangulate and come together and think then can FNA make a recommendation to have this conversation with our partners um, on, on how we speak to that comprehensive plan and support our businesses pre and really critically now post COVID. Thanks Todd. Thank so much Cindy and, and Todd, thank you so much for, for um, joining us within this impromptu opportunity and um, it's to do some off-roading here with Cindy. Um, that's, that was really well, well, a good use of time, I say. Um, thank you for inviting me tonight. Thank you. I'm going to sign off. Good night, Todd. Um, so Carolyn Giordano was here from the Human Relations Commission, and she um, needed to jump off the meeting. And we're fortunate that Holly Bonfarrell, who's also in the Human Relations Commission, has joined us now um, to present the work they've been doing this week around um, in response to the murder of George, George Floyd. So Holly, are you able to unmute yourself there?
Yes, I can do that. How are you guys doing? Hi, Holly. Welcome. Thanks. And my apologies. I'm pinch hitting for Carolyn Giordano, who was our other um, commission member who is on this call for the first two hours and then had to be able to put her kids to bed. So she texted me. It's like, can you hop on? And I said, sure. So we have a statement on behalf of the Human Relations Commission. If it's okay with you guys, I'll just read it. Bob, is that all right? Please. please. That's, that's what this time is for. All right. Terrific. Thank you so much. The Narberth Human Relations Commission condemns all acts of racism and discrimination. We recognize that the events of recent weeks, including the murder of George Floyd, have intensified the pain and suffering that people of color have long endured. We join others around the world in searching for real and meaningful ways to confront racism, discrimination, injustice, and violence. Right now, the commission is here to support our immediate community. Our commission was created by the Narberth Borough Government in 2017 as a mechanism to uphold and promote Narberth's commitment to anti-discrimination. The NHRC was established to receive and mediate complaints of discrimination in the areas of employment, housing and commercial property, public accommodations, and access to post-secondary educational institutions. We embrace that responsibility and have worked since our establishment to create policies and procedures to broadly address discrimination when it occurs in the borough. The NHRC plans to take the following steps in the weeks ahead. Step one, send the rules and regulations that will govern the adjudication of any complaints brought before the NHRC to borough council for approval. Pursuant to the ordinance passed in 2017, we will be seeking to adopt expanded procedures. Two, organize virtual community listening sessions. These listening sessions will provide an opportunity for people who live, work, and play in our community to have their experiences in Narberth heard and to express to the NHRC steps they feel we and the borough government at large can take to address issues of discrimination and racism in our community. And finally, three, once the rules and regulations of the NHRC are approved, begin a public outreach campaign to raise awareness of the commission and our role. Narberth is one small community. The greatest resource and support we have is one another. And we urge all people who are part of the Narberth community to make their voices heard. We can learn from one another and grow as a community, but only when we are willing to truly listen. We must all work together to end discrimination and we must hold space and listen to those of us who've experienced racism and injustice. We encourage everyone to come to a listening session or to reach out to the NHRC with your experiences and concerns. Together, we can change our community and in so doing, help change the world. Yours in service, the Narberth Human Relations Commission, Andrew Charles Chair, Rebecca Weistar, myself, Holly Bond Farrell, Carolyn Giordano, PhD, and Mina Seif, PhD. That ends our statement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Holly. And please extend our thanks to all of the members of the HRC for their time and their commitment to this. And um, we, I'm, I'm certain that we're all kind of in a listening mode at this time and uh, look forward to doing that. Um, and, and, and learning more from you and uh, learning about the rules and regulations that you'll be bringing to us later Certainly. in the year. Yeah. As do we, and our commission will meet next Tuesday at 5.30 in the afternoon, and we'll be posting the Zoom information so that anyone who wants to come in during the public comment period at that time and speak to us may do so then. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you all, good night. Um, I see hands, so I'm gonna. Why don't you stay on the call, Holly, if you're gonna, for a moment, please. I can do that. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna go to Rob and then Cindy. Uh, thank you, Holly, and uh, I just wanted to invite you to collaborate with uh, public health and safety. So, if there are any recommendations that you have coming from your commission, as we look to be proactive. Um, we would welcome any, any suggestions or recommendations in our committee to consider. 
So I, I just want to say that. Thank you. Well, thank you. And we will certainly pass any on. So far for the last period of months, our focus has really been on creating rules and regulations by which we could adjudicate a wide variety of complaints and an expanded notion, as was noted in the statement. But going forward, we really do feel like listening to people in the community and hearing what can we do above and beyond this mediation and adjudication process is a very, very important piece. So we will absolutely reach out to public health and safety and thank you so much for that invitation. Cindy. Uh, it was a wave of, of thanks and appreciation. Thank you. And it's, and I, th I think in particular in the coming years, as we really reckon with these issues, it's, it's so important for us to be hearing from the community through your, through your group, through your voices. We, I mean, I see you as, a rep, as representing the, the values of our community. And um, we will add those, that have braid those together with other voices that are similar and different. Um, so here we are in the agenda now, we're at the committee reports. I wanna just ask, do you guys wanna take three minutes for a short break before we push through the remainder of this agenda or any, uh, any thoughts, just speak up if you want a two minute break. The two minute stretch break would be great. Anybody else? Okay, so you could also, uh, Everyone back? Fred, are you ready to roll? Yeah, I'm ready. I think. Uh, Committee back? I'm not sure everybody's back. Okay, let's see if Mona, Michelle, Matt. I guess that's the hazard of taking a short break is that it ends up yeah. being a little longer, a little longer. I think four or five might have been a, a better, a more realistic number. Uh, yeah. Two minutes is tight. <laughs> I'm going to get water and I'll be right back.
someone ate an apple on a very large Zoom meeting that I had for work. We're back. Okay, Fred, uh, Michelle oh, we're back. and we're back now. Okay, Fred, please, uh, infrastructure report. All right. So uh, we began with a discussion of the uh, PRP, which you've heard uh, presented here. Um, we discussed, uh, so the bike lane planning, we're still continuing it, but uh, we're waiting to hear from uh, the planners that we identified, the uh, Montgomery County and the uh, Delaware Valley. And I think Sean uh, has since spoken to uh, some of those folks. Yeah, I spoke to Montgomery County at length. I'm still waiting to hear back from DVRPC. Um, the county would be able to assist the borough. It would have to be done under the umbrella of its existing planning services contract, either as something that they would do within that contract, setting aside work that they are currently involved in, or it would have to be an add-on kind of a la carte addition to the program. Um, the end product though would not be the engineered uh, plan or drawing that we're looking for to be able to deliver to the public work staff to implement. I'm hopeful maybe DVRPC might be a partner who might be able to deliver this to the borough. Um, I won't know until I have that conversation with them. I do know that in DVRPC's work program, they do have some money set aside for tactical urbanism. I didn't check to see how much it was, but I think we've targeted the right person at DVRPC to talk to. And we've, we've uh, been back and forth on emails a couple of times and I want to um, uh, have a phone conversation with her before I um, make a recommendation to the to council and the committee as to what we should be doing next. All right. So we're continuing to explore um, what the uh, what the cost might be of, of working with different groups here. Mm -hmm. um, we let's see. Uh, we had a discussion of the parking study. So um, I asked Michelle to uh, take the lead on looking at how Borough Council might go about implementing the recommendations um, on the parking study. Uh, so Michelle, do you want to um, talk a little bit about your um, proposal um, now, or do we want to? I thought you. I, I got the message that we weren't. You didn't. We didn't want to talk about it tonight. Well, Isn't sorry. That, I mean, I, we should... Doesn't it that it was premature because there's some things that we need to sort of coordinate more with our administrative staff need, needs a little bit more input. Uh, that was that was the that was what I thought I heard. All right. Well, I, so was I, I, I wasn't going to talk about it because because of that. I was thought, oh, I put a put a hold on it. Okay. So we're we're, we're discussing uh, a, a task force idea um, for the uh, for the implementation of the parking study, but we're still waiting. I, I think there's still more information to um, be generated, maybe before it's it's ready to go to. Uh, yeah, I mean, briefly, we had a good discussion, but it, and I think that I was very heartened to hear Matt, who's worked a ton on parking say he thinks at this point, you know, we've got enough ducks in a row. We've got our, we've got our enforcement apparatus in place. We have, we have data and data collection capacities that, that would allow this to be a good time to move forward with implementing the parking study. Uh, the feedback I got post meeting was that maybe the idea of the task force needs more, needs more one-on-one -on -one with Sean and with Matt before we bring it to full council. So I, I didn't want to raise that for discussion sure. unless you feel strongly that we move forward, in which case we can talk about it. But um, given the hour and given that I understand that maybe Sean in particular wants to have, have more input into that before we, we bring it up as a general and, and move forward with it, maybe we should table it. I mean, it's not like this is, we've got a lot on our plate. This is right, urgent. If there's no council decision to be made at this moment, then I think that's- We'll, 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 we'll take this up again uh, later on, but we just, we are considering uh, implementation of it in committee and we will continue to do so. Um, okay. over the next um, few months. Um, and let's see, we got an update uh, from Matt about the uh, LED light project. Can I just interject something here, Matt and um, Fred and Michelle? I just, what I'm seeing about this idea and I really admire is that you you I see your commitment not to have the council make decisions about implementation of parking that doesn't really include the voices 
of others within our community. So we don't make the same mistakes we've made in years past where, you know, we, the council implemented a change, say, in something about parking without really vetting it through members of our community, the people who live here first. And I, and I just want to, I just, I'm admiring that that's really what you're up to, Michelle and Fred. And I, I think that's important to just, you know, underscore. So people who are listening get that that's what you mean when you say, you know, this next step with parking implementation. I'm just also aware that there's maybe kind of a, a box to connect in terms of the internal working with Matt and uh, Matt and uh, Matt and uh, Sean. Sean. <laughs> I think that's yeah. Well, well put. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So much for that. The public input is a point where we're not on the point of making any changes right now. We're still talking right. process. Right. So you don't have you don't have any, any questions for you don't have questions for anybody yet. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, did you want to jump back in there? No. No, okay. I think I think I think we'll table. I think we'll we'll keep working on a committee. We'll we'll sort of circle back with uh, with Sean and Matt, and then I think maybe maybe at our next workshop meeting we'll have something more ready ready to talk about as a group. And we continue to get that, up to John, does that sound so, like something you're comfortable with? Yeah, just in the interest of time, why don't we move on? And if and I see him nodding. You're still muted there, Matt, uh, Sean. Yeah, it's just going to take a little bit more time for us, for me in particular, because of other things that I'm doing and other things staff is doing and the time I've had to look at what, what you know, I've seen it for the first time just a few weeks ago. So yeah, some more time would be helpful. And that would be just in terms of like this chart, that would be kind of like the idea was, oh, this, I'm not being helpful here. <laughs> Next meeting, sorry. sorry. But it's- I think we're all clear on anything we're gonna- uh, It just, it has to do with the movement through the flow through this chart to keep the project flowing in an unencumbered way so everyone can be successful. Okay, go fair forward, Fred. Okay. And then we also got updates on the, the longstanding borough projects of the LED lights, which we're waiting on uh, Public Utility Commission. I think uh, they have to sign off on the purchase, but they're not meeting. So we have to wait for them to meet and uh, give us ownership of the lights and then we can get the new bulbs in. So it's taking longer than, uh, than we'd hoped. And then the, you know, the bridge is still trucking along. There are no major uh, decision points for council at the moment on the bridge. Um, okay. So I think that's where we stand in infrastructure. Finance and administration. Cindy. Okay, thank you. Um, I will be brief. Um, Sean gave us an update on uh, COVID-19, which we all heard at our full council meeting. He let us know that the office is running in full capacity, which we know as well. Um, an update on the building access locks. Um, we came in under budget, COVID-19 put uh, kind of a halt into this process and the office is revisiting the price and giving a demonstration. And that's that kind of key card access system to our own properties. Um, we shared the results of our open house and asked for continued communication via social media, that being Facebook and the Flash newsletter. Um, we asked that links to agenda and construction updates be put um, on Facebook, and that was really per feedback we received from that open house. Um, items we discussed were potentials of how the business privilege tax could be used to support businesses. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, given the time, that we want to discuss that right now, um, but I'll defer to Mona on that. You're muted. I'm sorry, say that one more time, Cindy. Oh, I'll defer to you. Um, would you like to update everyone on um, how we may use a business privilege tax to support businesses? I mean, I think it's it's what you've already talked about, right? With potentially the idea of hiring someone to recruit and retain um, businesses. I think that's that's one way. I mean, of course, there's other ways that we've always promoted uh, community-wide events, but I think that's what we're looking at right now because it seems like we aren't going to be able to or, or um, reduce the business privilege tax without affecting our ability to collect it permanently. 
-hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. So, and, 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 oh, and I'm sorry. And I've been, I have been, I reached out to media to see what they're doing. I reached out to Westchester to see what they're doing. I reached out to Lower Marion Township. I reached out to Ambler. I have not yet heard back from all the people, but I haven't, um, I haven't heard any new idea, ideas yet that we haven't already discussed, but I, I'm going to keep reaching out to other municipalities to see what they're doing as well. Mm -hmm. So in kind of the, the grid you showed, Bob, and where we are in, in kind of the standard operating procedure is Aaron kind of gave us the green light to explore this. We're discussing this in committee. Yep, that's the one. Um, FNA will then um, decide who else from the community needs to be involved as we travel down. Um, as I mentioned, where we had Todd, we've had independent discussions with the Narberth Business Association, now with the Planning Commission and an external just bid manager to have a, a consultation. And all of these folks will come together at a meeting um, as we travel down the process we agreed on. But we really are starting to see a pattern here. Um, the NBA does 90% of what a bid coordinator or a Main Street manager would do. We've all kind of articulated gaps in both grants um, acquisition, retail recruitment, and really the big future bid mitigation. So we'll have a report for you next month for that. Um, the office has communicated that they are interested in moving ahead with organizing permits and those user agreements for our fields. Um, so regular users will be invited to our July meeting. That's the NAA, the Narberth Girls Basketball League, the Narberth Boys Basketball League. Um, if the fields are open for organized sports, FNA has recommended that we ask for proof of insurance and indemnification of the borough. And that's all I have at this time, unless anyone from FNA wants to add anything. Mona, Fred, the office. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Robin Grevy, Public Health and Safety. Yeah, uh, thank you, Bob. I, I just wanted to add. Um, Cindy, before I give my report, just that I can help you with the retail recruiter idea because we did a lot of research on that a couple of years ago in economic development. So oh. we had reached out to Maniunk and Ardmore. I have quite a few notes on that. I can share. Oh my gosh. I didn't even think about that. I know that you did all that work, Rob. I'm sorry. No, I mean, at the time, we decided not to move forward, okay. but now it's COVID, you know, so we should definitely revisit. Well, we were concerned about retail prior to COVID. Um, Post-COVID, mm -hmm. uh, it's critical. So, right, right. yeah, I'm sorry that I didn't connect with you. That, no, I just wanted to save you some work, that's all. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't reach out to you. Thanks. Okay, so um, in public health and safety, we discussed the yellow phase transition beginning Friday with the mayor, and Andrea walked us through um, the precautions that we'll have in place, and those will be made available on the website. Um, part of that discussion is a decision um, about how to support the businesses along Hamford Avenue so that they can have outdoor dining and also allow for pedestrians to cross at a safe distance on the sidewalk. So, you know, we, we were discussing the possibility of blocking off some of the parking spaces. And that's just something that we discussed. We didn't come to a decision, but I believe, Andrea, we left it so that you as mayor would coordinate with Ed Ridgeway and, um, and the staff, and we, we would come to some proposal that we could we right. could consider. We, we've discussed a number of options. And, and frankly, there is no perfect solution. There are, there are issues with every which way we have come up with. Um, one of the discussion, one of the, the issues is when we, when they open with outside dining with tables against their uh, facility and maybe even against other facilities of, of, of uh, properties where the owner lets them do that, does that force the pedestrians into the street? Um, and should we be putting up, you know, a, a, a barrier uh, in, in the parking lane where it would be safe for pedestrians to walk? Um, you know, we're, there are issues with temporary barriers, there's issues with permanent barriers. Um, uh, what we're going to do is, is hold off this weekend, watch and see how it goes. Um, we're going to have to make adjustments as we, as we go along and, and see what works and what's not working. And we'll have to be flexible to try and help. Um, as I said before, we've come up with the, the uh, possibility of 
uh, closing off certain areas, we uh, that's come up, and um, it just is not very practical for a lot of the restaurants in the area. So, um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Andrew. So, um, the second item would be the emergency management coordinator. We tabled that for July because the chief could not be with us um, tonight, and obviously we want him involved in that conversation. Uh, the third item was the EAC update. And so Jesse Lytle and his team uh, was here with us tonight to share um, more on the carbon inventory and transitioning to the climate action plan. And we got to see tonight some of how the software um, that's been made available to us through the DEP, it's called Clear Path through ICLEI, um, can really uh, support decision making. Um, so that we can achieve our carbon goals um, over the next 10, 20 years. So their forecasting tools, it's a really very powerful software that uh, the EAC will be using this month um, with the support of ICLEI to put together a climate action plan. We would like to hold a public forum in the fourth week of June. And so we're going to propose a date um, in the next week or so that would be open to the public. And this would be a meeting when the EAC could share more of their work and invite public comment. And uh, that would be built in to the climate action plan that they're drafting. And then they'll put a plan before us to consider um, in, in the fall. Okay. We have more for public health and safety, Rob. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Um, it's time for public comment. I don't know that there's anyone here. I see one phone number here. And I'm I not see sure Fred Bob on. has a question. Sorry, I had a question for Rob. Fred, thank you, Rob. Um, should we really be setting up public meetings for the end of June? I mean, if we're in yellow. Oh, no, I, I'm sorry, I meant Zoom. It would be Zoom. Zoom meeting? OK, great. Yeah. Good clarification. Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to make a comment? I only see, I see the Civic Association number. I see a phone number here, 215-284-8553. Is that staff? I'm not sure who that is. Anyone know? Um, unmute yourself if you'd like three minutes to make a comment. Not hearing any comments from the public. So let's go to our action items. Um, Rec board appointments. Um, Cindy, do you have um, do you have do you, do you know the names of the candidates and would you like to make a motion? Um, oh, Fred. Or excuse me, Fred Scott. I, I see your hand well, up. I, I was I was going to propose that since we're considering we may be considering changes to the um, rec board ordinance at the next meeting that we could do the appointment then. I mean, I, I don't know. If everyone's ready, we can do it now, but. Let's, um, let's do it it's on the agenda for now. I think let's just let's do it now. It's been so long. So the three names that I have, um, and Sean, you'll correct me if the, if I'm missing anything in the in the temp folder. Those that I reviewed are Jonathan Peterson, Carol Marie Scanlon, um, and Mary Kay Hamburger. Those are the the three I see. Fred, you're shaking your head now. Mary Kay is already on the. Um, yeah, I saw her application in the temp folder, but it isn't look... Brendan Gallagher. Gallagher, yeah. He okay. he withdrew he withdrew his application. He withdrew. Okay, so it's Jonathan I, and so it's, it's Jonathan. Um, what, okay. Um, I, I personally would would like to speak on behalf of, of Jonathan Peterson, JP Peterson. I actually did this at our last meeting, and we decided. Um, not to make the motion. So I won't reiterate it and say anything other than he's been an advocate for securing open and recreational space um, within our borough. He has been active um, in both coaching athletics, but in the larger community. And I really think this would be an opportunity to have his kind of st steady guidance and commitment to open space and diverse recreation in our community. And I, I really support uh, and would like, would like to make a motion unless you'd like to have a discussion um, with both candidates, Bob. Is there, is there any other speaking about candidates? I, I would like to say that I think just, you know, all of this talk about equity and racial equity. I, 
I don't, I ha- I'm new to council. I don't know how this process usually happens. I know we're very busy, but I also feel like that equity has to carry over to everything that we do. And if we want to think about bringing new people into our boards and commissions and new community members to participate, I think that our process should involve giving people the opportunity to come and meet council in person and answer questions because I all I saw were a couple cover letters, very brief. Um, I didn't see resumes unless I was able, unless I was um, blocked from seeing them because my Adobe wasn't working right. So to me, that's not enough to measure the quality of a candidate. And I, I just feel like it could slip too easily into let's pick the people that we know and we have personal connections with. And as we know, those networks often discount equity. So to me, I just think we we need to rethink that process. I will say this has been open for six months. Yeah. And I, I just want to say for the moment, this is on the agenda now. We, we punted it at an earlier meeting. We did punt it to this meeting. It's on the agenda to make an appointment. I At this point, I, I truly respect what you're saying, Mona. Yeah. And I think we should certainly make effort in, as we go forward to do more outreach And in the past, we've often provided opportunities for the candidates for different boards and commissions to come in and be interviewed by council. And and that can certainly be done. It's not a requirement that we do it that way. Um, It's not even a requirement that I think that we advertise. The council can can appoint whoever they want to boards and commissions. But I I think all of us hear you and, and think that going forward, that makes sense to make that kind of effort. But we ha- we do have several candidates that have been waiting, that have been interested in the position. The board needs members, and um, we-, we have this on our agenda to vote this evening. So do I hear a motion? I'd like to make a motion to p- appoint Jonathan Peterson to the uh, Recreation Board. Is there a second? I see Rob's hand. Maybe you have to unmute and say it. Second. Um, <laughs> Is there any conversation to have? I, I personally, I, I like him a lot. I'm gonna vote no only because I, I disagree with the process. And I think that for me, just seeing three, I think the advertising process was open for a long time and that's good. And I think a lot of people had the chance to apply, but if I only know one of the candidates right and i don't know the others then my own personal bias could so that's my opinion Uh, that's why i'd like a chance to meet candidates in person and be able to ask them questions i think it gives you a little bit more to go on rather than just i know this person and i like them maybe you could i mean instead of voting no no i think i don't want to be like procedural lady but i think you could amend i don't know what the process is i think you could bring a friendly amendment to table it and see if there's consensus to do that if you would rather do that than, than oh. just voting no on somebody <laughs> i think that's another way to, oh. okay. to make your concern <laughs> real so we have a motion okay. oh, we have thank a motion you we have a second <laughs> you, have to, you have to each of those people would have to be willing to back out you know back their motion out do you want to ask? Do you want to ask for that, or do you? Or, or I, I, can I, I? Is now the right time to make the motion? No, you would make a friendly. You would ask. You would oh, ask, in a, in a ask, you'd ask you'd Rob ask. seconded the motion if he's willing <laughs> to entertain your friendly amendment. You'd ask Cindy if she's will agrees with it as well. Um, oh, thank you, thank you, Rob. Would you be willing to entertain my friendly amendment to um, invite these people to come answer a couple questions at a council meeting before we appoint? Um, I want to be friendly, Mona. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. But but I um, I would rather just vote on it. I mean, it's yeah. in our process. Um, but and, and then change the process going forward. So uh, my preference would be to just vote. On, on this up and up or down. Okay, so so we have we have a we have a motion on uh, on the table in a second. We have conversation discussion. Any more discussion? So hearing none, we'll have we'll vote. All in favor of appointing J. P. Peterson to the Narvath Recreation Board, say aye. 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 
and it looks like the eyes have it. Are the the nays? How many do we have? Nay. We have a nay. So it's so we have a vote of five to one. Okay. Six to one. One. We didn't five see. To five. five to one. Thank you. Very good. Action item B. Downtown land development consultant proposal. A uh, Mr. Metric. This is a proposal that was uh, forward to, to council at our last meeting. We had to make a kind of last minute adjustment to nothing really material to the pro proposal, just the way it was, uh, just, just some of the labels we used and some of the um, uh, terms and conditions of the proposal. So we did not uh, vote on it at our last meeting. So we're now doing the unorthodox thing, which is to take an action item and put it in our workshop. But this proposal has been written to assist the borough with evaluating land development proposals uh, in its uh, downtown commercial district. And it's an open-ended proposal that would be done at a um, proposed hour hourly rate uh, that you all have seen. And, um, the, uh, it's from e e Consult uh, Incorporated. Um, do you want to have, may I, can I get a motion? Um, I'd, oh. Hire e SI e Consult Solutions Inc. to enter into a contract. Bob, I'll make the motion to uh, enter into a contract with uh, for downtown land development consultant per the proposal given to us last week. I hear a second. Second. I have to speak up. I'm not sure. Oh, second, Rob. Rob, Rob McGreevy. Is there any discussion? I can't see all of you, so I'm, there we go. Now I can see all of you. Questions or discussion? Seeing none, we can vote. All in favor of the motion? Say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. It's unanimous. Thank you. We now are ready for announcements. Does anyone have any announcements? Um, Bob, I have, have one community announcement and then one personal statement if we have time. Um, community announcement is this Friday. We have our Narberth Business Association's first Friday and um, our dog pageant at 6 p.m. So folks um, can up until midnight send pictures of their dog. Um, How does that work? Um, Narberth Online. Uh, you can submit. There are posters all over Facebook and Instagram with details of categories. You can send in up until, I guess, you have uh, less than two hours to make the deadline. Um, and then you can log on via Facebook Live um, on Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, on a more serious note, I would like to just uh, take a minute with your permission to just read a statement, a personal statement, um, after the events of last week. If that's okay? Please. Uh, and I so appreciate the HRC's uh, statement as well. There is an indisputable deep-rooted history of marginalization and pain in the African-American community. And George Floyd is a familiar example of a symptom to a much larger problem. Many have made statements and reaffirmed their personal commitment or organization's commitment to anti-racism. I'm less interested in more statements and personally wish to explore how we can be both active allies and address the systemic faults in our American policing system. I clearly see the first step in this journey as reminding our federal order of police of Robert Peel's important statement, the police, the police are the public and the public are the police. Citizen oversight and active participation in the practice and theory of policing is critical. We are held hostage by collective bargaining and defense of some police who should not be granted the discretion to enforce our laws. Narworth is poised to be progressive leaders, just as we were in the plastics ordinance, and demand public participation in our policing system. 
I'm deeply thankful for the leadership of Chief Gallagher. He brings an integrity and professionalism to our force. The individual officers work daily as stakeholders in our community. I look forward to partnering with our police to break the insulary culture of our national police system and help to co-create a system where policing is no longer merely law enforcement, but also explicitly a system of public health and safety for all. I believe Narberth has the police officers, chief and elected officials to hear this call and take action now. I'm thankful for Commissioner Gale's statements where he defined Black Lives Matter groups as domestic terrorists and explained that screams racism is not only to expose bigotry and justice, but to justify the lawless destruction of our cities and communities because he made the covert overt. And now citizens have an undeniable clarity as to his character, moral compass, and can vote accordingly. His statement serves as a strong example as to why local elections matter. Imagine if every protester now attended their local public meetings and demanded police reform and abolishment of systems which perpetuate violence and hatred. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Mona, announcement? Thank you. Yeah, I, I read this statement earlier in Public Health and Safety, but I think it's important to reread it in council. Um, so give a, a statement on everything that's been going on in our nation. Um, my heart is in pain for George Floyd's family and for all people of color who are grieving and who have to live in fear of what might happen to their own family members. The murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer who knelt on his neck while other officers stood by and did nothing must be answered for. Police brutality is a symptom of the white supremacy that has plagued our nation since its founding and we all must work to end that violence. I do wanna start in terms of our borough by saying that I am so grateful to have police officers, Belfi, Dutton, Lynn, McCabe, and Vernaccio serving our borough. These officers work with professionalism, courtesy, and concern for the safety of all. I have confidence in Mayor Deutsch, Council President Muderick, Police Chief Gallagher, Fire Chief Dixon, and Borough Manager Metric to lead our community through such difficult times. And I also think it's very important to say that I have the utmost respect for police officers who serve and protect because they choose every day to serve in a profession where they put themselves at risk to keep each other safe, to keep, I'm sorry, to keep others safe. On a daily basis, they answer calls where they see the worst in human nature and yet must respond with respect for the dignity of the people involved. They have to be on guard at all times while de-escalating dangerous situations. I need to put my reading glasses on. Sorry, I don't wanna <laughs> misquote myself. And these are true talents requiring highly skilled professionals and our police officers need our support. But police officers are human beings and none of us are immune to the systemic racism that we were raised in. Prejudice exists in every community. I often say that Narberth is my dream town because I always wanted to live in a front porch community where neighbors look out for each other. And I do feel so blessed to live here, but I've also been shocked by what I've heard from some Narberth residents. One who complained of the unwashed non-residents using our parks. One who complained about adults with disabilities working in our town. And another who said we need to kick out the immigrants. My husband has heard neighbors say derogatory things about Jews. And my neighbor asked if he was asked if he came to this country illegally simply because of his accent and the color of his skin. So if we are being honest with ourselves, we've all heard family members, friends or neighbors say prejudiced things. We as Americans inherited a system that is full of institutional racism and we can't afford to ignore it any longer. It's tearing our communities apart. Our economy was built in part on slavery and the exploitation of immigrant workers. And we clearly see the resulting economic injustices today during this crisis. Our educational system was built on segregation 
And today, too many schools lack diversity and funding for even the most basic student needs. Our system of government was built while disenfranchising people of color. And even today, some government officials are trying to strip thousands of eligible voters of their right to vote by using illegal voter purges. Our criminal justice system has systemic racism in all areas from stopping and frisking to arrests, to trials, jury verdicts, and sentencing. You only need to look at government data to see how convictions and sentencing for the same crime differ dramatically based on the race of the alleged, alleged criminal and victim. Mass incarceration disproportionately robs black people of their liberty. The US makes up roughly 5% of the world population, but we lock up close to 25% of the world's prisoners. We imprison more of our own citizens than China and Russia do. People of color, have endured for 528 years since Europeans immigrated to the Americas and began brutalizing people of color, all the while justifying white violence by calling other human beings violent savages. We've made progress, but the tragic repetition of that same pattern of violence this month was a breaking point. A prophetic visionary once said, we've come too far to turn back now. Our nation has much to account for, and we must start right here in Narber. Together as a community, we can reject discrimination and end the cycle of violence. We can bring love into politics in a fierce and unapologetic way. We can follow the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who taught us that hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We can come to get across color lines and party lines to work together to end systemic racism in our own community and protect the safety of our citizens, our visitors, and our police officers. As a member of Borough Council, I'm committed to ensuring that Narberth works toward best practices in anti-racism, de-escalation, and professional training for our officers in order to safeguard our residents and visitors. We must research all tools available to us to pushing for anti-racism training for all borough staff, elected officials, and Narberth Fire Department volunteers because this is about dialogue and transformation. It's about recognizing each other's common humanity. I'm truly honored to serve with our current team of elected officials, staff, and volunteers who I trust and respect and who work with integrity to better our community. We have a real opportunity with this team to make Narberth a model of best practices in policing, public service, and equity. But government officials and staff cannot do this alone. Narberth residents are an integral part of this effort. We all are affected by the bias that we were raised in, so we all have a responsibility. Call out prejudice when you see it in your own circles. Go outside of your comfort zone and listen to people you don't normally speak with. Learn from other people's perspectives. Reach out to people of color and ask them how you can support them in this time. Reach out to our police officers and thank them for their service. Be kind to each other. These are painful times and we are all suffering, but these are the ways we will begin to heal our wounds together. And maybe if we can all learn from each other and move forward in this community, perhaps we can forge a path for other communities to begin healing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mana. Other announcements? I think this is a good stopping place. Thank you all. So much for your time. We send our love and prayers, blessings to the Mutterick family, to Aaron. We certainly miss his leadership. Look forward to being with him again on June 17th for our business meeting. Can I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. A second. A second. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Bob, standing in so well. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night, everybody.